Jimmy's going to come in here. Great. All right. Good morning. Are we recording? All right. Very good. Well, I'm going to call today's meeting to order. This is so exciting. Um, Donna, are we ready? I'm sorry. Yes, I'd love to make a couple of announcements first. Uh, I'd ask everybody to silence their cell phones. Um, and also just a reminder that the restrooms are right outside the door to your right and right again. So please make use of those as you wish. Uh, we have a lot of material to go through today and Michael and I will try to keep everyone on track. Uh, there's a lot of terrific information we're going to be sharing. Um, so we have called to order. Uh, a roll call, Donna. All right. Director Brown. Present. Director Downey. Present. Director Dutra. Director Colentary Johnson. Present. Director Conan. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers is absent today. Director Paper. Here. Director Parker is absent today. And Director Rockin. Here. Uh, Ex officio Director Henderson is absent today. And Ex officio Director North. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for announcements, I want to note that today's meeting is being recorded by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. I believe they will be able to rebroadcast this and edit out the breaks and so forth. So that will be available. Thank you for your work on that today. Well, will this be on our website? Good question. There will be a link. Uh, any communications from the board on items that are not on the agenda? Looking around. This is exciting seeing people in person. Uh, how about. Well, wait, you, you know, just to thank you because oh. I show for the work with Scott Light Fire and the training and, and all of that. And, um, sounds like it really went well. We appreciate that outreach. Very good. Thank you. Any members of the public have anything to add today? I'm looking to labor as well. Hello, labor. All right. Not seen <laughs> uh, And I don't believe we have any additional documentation other than what was placed at each of the seats. Yes, the, and, and it's available to the public as well. Very good. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Michael Tree, and uh, take this show on the road, please. That sounds great. And we don't have a mic, right? It's just uh, the... Up there, so the that, audience oh, right in the Do I need to use that since we're recording and... That would be, that would help carry your All right. voice. I'll and just take a couple of seconds of the stand if you want. I'll use the mic just in case it uh, needs to be picked up. What'd you say it was, Donna? Oh, it's, a, it's, uh, right it's right there. Oh, it's right there. It's the center yeah. mic, no, no, where no, you can use the podium mic like on the oh, side. I'll just, I'll just oh, kind of tuck myself. See that one there? Yeah, there. And then here's for advancements. Oh, nice. Everybody all right if I'm just kind of like close mm -hmm. to this? Sure. Um, I literally only have two slides, because my job is to kind of like get out of the way and let the experts come and chat this morning. But um, I did want to, uh, you know, welcome everyone this morning. I'm pretty excited for the future. I've, uh, I've been here six months, and it's like really exciting to see everybody around the table in person. There's just a different atmosphere when everybody's kind of looking at each other and, and reading each other as we, we have discussions. So I'm nervous, and I always tell myself when I'm nervous, it just means it's really important. And when I nick myself when I'm shaving, I know it's damn important. <laughs> <laughs> I nick myself this morning a little bit. So. <laughs> Listen, I wanted to uh, first just tell you, over the last six months, it's been really great to work with the board and community leaders. I see Guy Preston here from RTC. He's going to play a part in a uh, project we're working on that we'll talk about. We've broken the, the workshop into three sessions because there's really three things that I have seen are really important to Santa Cruz County and to the board. 
the first session is on ridership. We want to talk about where we want to go with ridership, but there's some really key fundamentals to ridership uh, that are planning fundamentals. So we brought the best planner in the nation uh, to talk with you this morning about uh, not so much about our goal for ridership, but about planning principles that support getting to that goal, because there's trade-offs. And as you know, you're driving Metro as board members, and those trade-offs will be really important as we move forward. And then we wanted to talk about uh, the environment. Um, you know, riding the bus, you have a big impact on the environment um, as a rider, um, but you're also seen as a technology leader in the county, and so we want to talk to you about zero emission buses. Buses, you've had a lot of discussion over the years with your master plan for the zero emission uh, bus technologies, and uh, you also have an implementation plan. Uh, money has been the key to getting into zero emission buses, and we have worked really hard over the last six months to analyze several different scenarios. We've got a recommendation for you this morning that we just want to get your input on, and then we'll bring it back later for some action at your at a near future board meeting. So, you know, when I came on board, uh, my direction to staff was I prefer to never buy another damn tailpipe again when it comes to buses. And that has been a huge Herculean challenge for your finance staff, but we've got some planning done and wanted to show up today. And then the last is housing. Everywhere I go, man, that is a big topic of discussion. Uh, the Mercury News came out with an article probably about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, that other than San Francisco, you had the highest rents here in Santa Cruz County than any other place in the nation. And that's a big deal, right? It's a big deal for our workforce. We've got the best operators that I've ever been a part, uh, you know, of uh, being in an organization, a transit agency, and great mechanics. Um, you have great staff all the way around at Metro. I mean, I'm just really excited to work uh, with the staff we have. But man, I'll tell you, some of these folks do an hour and a half commute into work, work a split shift for you that encompasses up to 12 hours. And then they turn around and do an hour and a half to move home. So huge sacrifices being made to put the service on the road. So we want to talk about housing because there's some opportunities uh, that you're currently a part of. And there's some opportunities that we envision moving forward that we wanted to chat with you about. So there's three sessions. We're pretty excited. I will conclude my results as we embark on session one with three goals. Uh, that. Uh, I just want you to think about today, especially in session one, as you're hearing about trade-offs and uh, some opportunity that, um, that our consultant brings uh, with him, uh, Jarrett Walker. So here's the, here's the goals. Um, your executive staff has talked, and we have come up with different ideas and scenarios on how to get there. But we want to increase your ridership 100% in the next five years from a baseline of fiscal year, this current fiscal year. So we think you're going to be at 3.5 million rides by the end of the year. We want to get it to seven within five years. Uh, we want to purchase only zero emission buses moving forward and convert your entire fleet by 2037. This is like a massive leadership role, not only in Santa Cruz County, but in the nation. You're gonna have a lot of eyes watching what you're doing. Um, there's some rare exceptions that we probably will talk to you about on an ongoing basis, like your huge articulated buses. We're not quite 100% sure that technology is ready for battery electric bus or hydrogen on the specific routes where we need to run them, but we haven't ruled it out yet. But um, I think the big picture is we don't want to buy tailpipe anymore when we go and make a bus purchase, and uh, that's the goal. And then the second is uh, you've already got 94 housing units under development there with the uh, Metro Center downtown. We view that you can get up to 175 units total, including that 94 when you consider two other locations where Metro has facilities, and so we want to talk to you about that. So those are the three goals. Um, what does a 100% ridership look like in the last five years in the context of Metro's ridership history? 
that's what it looks like, uh, that dotted line. And so you can see there's a whole lot of ambition packaged in the dotted lines moving forward to get you to seven million within the next uh, five years. I mean, key to that is trade-off in the board and a willingness to talk to the public. Um, we really want to introduce 15-minute rapid service. We've got some corridors that are key. You've got a lot of arena numbers where you're talking about where you want to put your housing. We want you to put it right there on those 15-minute corridors. There's an advantage to everyone when we're working together on a 15-minute rapid corridor. Uh, you've also got uh, your UC Santa Cruz and Cabrillo College. If you go out at certain times of the day, you'll see that we're leaving up to 20 people behind at bus stops. That's a, that is a, a cringe factor for your executive staff and for everybody at Santa Cruz Metro, but you have a huge opportunity there in regard to moving the ridership. And then last but not least, Watsonville. Watsonville has a ton of opportunity to uh, increase productivity. Uh, so, with that said, uh, I'm going to get out of the way and introduce Jarrett Walker. I know we've got, uh, is John Ergo yep. here? Okay. Uh, there we go. Why don't you introduce Jarrett Walker? And, uh, Adam, we'll Adam take Kirk, right? Good morning, everyone. John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the next two speakers. Uh, and it's just for a bit of context, over the next uh, one to two years, we're going to be embarking on a network reimagining plan for all of our fixed route service here in Santa Cruz Metro. And in advance of that, uh, we have done some uh, polling to try to uh, get some community feedback before we embark on this plan. And so I'm going to invite Adam uh, Sonenshine up to share the results of a SERP community survey that was conducted over the last two weeks that starts asking the community about these types of trade offs. So we have a limited budget fixed resources, any type of service change entails trade-offs. And so Adam, if we come up. Thank you, everyone. I'm Adam Sonnenschein with FM3 Research. We're a public opinion uh, polling and, and uh, research company based in California. I'm out of LA. We have offices in Oakland, and we have done um, quite a few projects in the Santa Cruz area, including for the county, including for RTC and, and others, and, and for a number of transportation agencies around the state. Um, so what we wanted to do here and what we were asked to do is get a little bit of a sense of uh, how people are thinking about uh, Metro, the services that you're offering, where their priorities are, and maybe what some of the improvements are that they would like to see. Um, so we did uh, a survey in, uh, just finished uh, last week, really. So it was uh, the first, last week of September into the first week of October. Um, the population of people we studied was any adult resident in the county, so anyone over the age of 18. Um, we had over a thousand survey interviews, which I, um, I know in the context of the whole county may seem small, but in the context of a survey of the county is actually quite big. Most of the time when we do surveys of the county, it would be 600 people. We do surveys of the state, it's usually 800 to 1,000 people uh, and, and tend to be highly accurate. So a survey sample of over 1,000 people is really uh, nice here. Um, we have a, a margin of error of plus or minus 4%. That's for questions that are asked of everybody. Um, if we look at any subgroup analysis, those margins of error are going to be larger as we're talking about a smaller group of people. Um, so we, re we reached people in a couple of different ways. First, there were telephone calls, which were done with a live telephone interviewer. We also sent out emails and text messages, which led to an online survey. People could do one or the other. They couldn't do both. And the online survey um, was not one of the ones where uh, it's just open to whoever gets it and they can post it to Facebook and have you know all their friends take it a hundred times and you know or they can do it multiple times. Um, it's a it's a controlled random sample, so you had to have a. a we, we looked at the, the county overall, the demographics, where people live, um, took a random sample of adults, contacted them, uh, and worked that list until we had uh, like a group that represents the county in a number of different factors, including. Uh, age and ethnicity, the city they live in, or, or area of the county they live in, etc. Um, the survey was available in English and Spanish, and sometimes you'll see something that doesn't quite add up to 100% or the number that you're expecting because we've rounded decimal points. Yeah. 
Um, so just starting with just general community attitudes and, and basic awareness. We ask people, and you can see that the text, I know it's probably small if you're, if you're on that side of the room, but at the top of, in, in italics it says, do you happen to know the name of the local agency that runs the bus system in your area? Um, over six and 10, uh, we're able to say Metro in some variety. Uh, we split out just so you have it, you know, Santa Cruz Metro SCT, Santa Cruz Metro Transit from just people who said Metro. 1% um, said the county or RTC. 2% um, gave some other answer, Caltrans or something like that. 5% just said yes, but didn't give an answer. Uh, and then about 30% said no, they don't know. They don't know the agency that, that runs the buses, or they said something like, oh, we don't have buses in our area. Um, so, uh, you know, this is sort of a glass half empty, half full kind of response, given the percentage of people who take your system regularly. <coughs> Many more people than that know the agency, but there's also three in 10 who don't know the agency at all and aren't able to name it. So um, this is something that just in, in the sort of future looking perspective, may want to think about how we have the people, more people know who's in charge here. We also wanted to see what kind of opinion they have of Metro as an agency. So this isn't necessarily a rating of the service, although I'm, I'm guessing most people are basing their rating based on the service. Um, 52% had a favorable impression of Metro, 14% had an unfavorable impression, and over a third had no opinion. You'll also notice that the <coughs> strong opinions here, very favorable, very unfavorable, are pretty low. Right? It's about 15% very favorable, 13% very unfavorable, and the bulk of that favorability is a soft, somewhat favorable. So in the context of this survey, we don't have the ability to probe and find out why they think this and what does somewhat favorable mean compared to something else. We just have the first point, which is finding out the statistics here. But it says there's there's a favorable view of the agency, but it's soft, right? And there's a lot of people that, that don't know. Um, now, one thing that's really helpful, I think, is if we look at people who ride compared to those who don't, um, those who ride have a very favorable opinion of the agency, okay? So on the left-hand side, you're looking at uh, the respondents who said they ride Metro once a month or more, um, to preview a future slide, that's 14% of the respondents. 81% of them had a favorable opinion of Metro, only 16% have an unfavorable opinion. Okay, so of your customer base, the folks who are using the system the most often, they're very happy with the agency. Uh, those who ride just a few times a year, which in this survey is about 17% who said that was the case for them, also very favorable, 76%. Those who don't ride at all, which is almost 70%, are more mixed, 39% favorable, 14% unfavorable, and 47% who don't know. So um, that side on the right here is, is, again, seven in 10 of all respondents. And they're in this squishy, you know, don't know, more favorable than unfavorable. They're, they don't have a bad impression of Metro, but many of them just have no impression at all. Okay, now looking at um, some questions around current, um, prior, and potential ridership. Uh, we ask people these days, how often do you ride on local Santa Cruz Metro buses? And I'm sorry for the folks, the, the question's in the bottom, and I'm sure from where you are, you probably can't see that, but when you get a copy, you'll be able to read it. Uh, and we broke it out, we asked them, is it once a week or more, a couple times per month, about once a month, just a few times a year or never? 8% um, said they ride once per week or more, 14% uh, say once a month or more in total. Um, now we always have to reflect on the fact that these are self-reported numbers, right? and there might be some folks who are feeling like, oh yeah, they should say they ride the bus, and these tend to get a little inflated when we ask people how often they ride. Um, but we're at 14% once a month or more, 17% just a few times per year, and then that almost 70% who just say they don't ride at all. Okay. Now we wanted to get some sense of of comparison to prior data or prior times. So we asked them, um, thinking back to 2019, the year before the pandemic, the COVID pandemic began, how often were you using those buses at that time? Um, similar percentage, but um, we're looking at a little bit of a different number here because we've got folks who didn't live in the area at that time, right? So you can see the 9% who didn't live in the area. The net of this is that we had about 9% who told us they were riding more frequently uh, before the pandemic than they are now. 
Um, we followed that up, those, those people, you can see it's 94 out of the 1,054 respondents, with um, here's a, some reasons why you, people, other people are writing less often. How much do these apply to you? Are these major reasons or minor reasons for you to be writing less often? Um, there's kind of two things near the top. One, it takes too long to get where I need to go on the bus, and then if you skip one and look at the bus does not come often enough. Um, we kind of saw both of those as a little bit of convenience kind of related to the bus and bus service. And then the second item, which um, has the largest major reason, which is just my transportation needs have changed. Uh, that could be I got a car, I work from home, I stopped working, my job changed to a different place, my girlfriend moved, whatever it is, I don't, I don't need the same service that I had before. Um, and that's the reason that I'm, I'm um, riding less. At this point, only about 50% of people say they're not they're riding less often because they're worried about COVID, with 25% saying that's a major reason for them. And then in your case, which is different than um, some other transit agencies, it's a relatively small number who would just say they don't feel safe on the bus for reasons other than COVID. Right? You only have 15% who would say that's a major reason for them. Um, in some other communities where we've asked similar kinds of questions, that's a much higher number. Um, we wanted to get a sense of the potential for people who are not riding to become riders. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways we wanted to look at that was by asking them about a kind of hypothetical scenario in which there's a, a convenient bus stop, a bus that goes by every 15 minutes and could put you within a block or two of where, where you need to go. So in other words, we kind of take the convenience factors off the table for them. Then how likely are they uh, to use the service once a month or more. Um, and we only ask this of people who are not using the service once a month or more now, um, which you'll recall is a, a healthy percentage of people. Okay. Um, so of these people, again, who are not riding now, 19% say they would be very likely to ride in the future under these conditions. Another 30% say they're somewhat likely. That's 49%, although if I'm looking at this, I'm kind of going to focus more on the 19 those people who, are, they're not just saying, yeah, I think about it, but they're, they're actually saying I'm very likely. Um, and that's a pretty significant bump in terms of your ridership, right? If you had 19% of the almost 90% of people that don't ride once a month actually riding once a month, that would, you know, I, I can't do that math in my head, but it's a lot of people. Um, and, and for the convenience, you've got about half of people um, who are saying that's basically not the factor for them. There's something else that's preventing them from, from riding. Okay, um, the next section deals with some of the priorities for uh, your services. Um, this slide has got the same question on a, on a couple of slides here. Uh, we told them, as they might know, Metro, which runs the, the bus service in your area, is a public agency. Um, whether or not you'd use the bus or not, how important are these various services that Metro um, provides now or could provide. Um, and they're rated on a scale from extremely important, which is the dark blue, very important, which is the, the, the next blue, somewhat important, which is kind of the turquoise. Um, we gave them both not very and not important at all options, which we grouped together in orange, and then don't know, which is the very small sliver in gray. Um, a few things before we get into the specific items, just looking at the totals here. There are a number of things that large percentages of people are saying would be extremely or very important to them, particularly remembering how few people are using your services now, right? So in, in the survey, um, we've got several items in the 80s for extremely or very important with another you know, 8 to 13% who would say they're at least somewhat important and very small percentages who would say they're not important to them at all um, or that they don't know. So that says to us, you, you have things in your, in your purview that people in the community actually care about, whether they're using the service or not at this time, okay? Top of the list in terms of importance, there's a couple of items. The first two items are, are kind of statistically the same. That's providing routes that make it possible for workers to get to where most jobs are and providing affordable transportation in places where many or most residents may not have personal transportation, okay? So those are two items that uh, we're a little bit higher than everything else. You see the extremely important at 57 or 56 percent, combined with extremely or very important 87, 85 percent. Um, similar numbers, just a 
very, very small tick below and really statistically not very much difference if we look at the, the overall. Providing services that are tailored to the needs of, el of the elderly and persons with disabilities. Providing transportation to the area's community colleges and universities. And then one more, helping reduce the growth of traffic congestion. Now some of these um, speak a little bit to how an individual who's responding to the survey might, um, might actually engage with the system. And some are more the benefits that they may gain from the system being improved and expanded even if they don't ride. So something like um, reducing the growth of traffic congestion may have nothing to do with them personally using your buses, but if other people use them, then there'll be less traffic and they'd be happy about that. Right? Um, a little bit lower if we look at extremely important, but still quite high on the last one, providing routes that make it possible for people to get to stores and appointments. You can see compared to the first item, right, that in terms of a prioritization, getting people to jobs is really, um, kind of the number one here. Um, next, but on the, the same question, um, other items that were maybe the next tier down, right, if we're thinking about kind of where the priorities lie, connecting to other public transit systems, transportation systems that allow for travel throughout the region, that's almost 80%. Helping reduce or limit increases in air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, 77%. Another one that's not specific to them using the system at all. Right? If other people use it, if other people aren't driving, we're going we're gonna to have cleaner air. Um, providing transportation to the area's high school, 74, that was a little lower than the colleges and universities. Um, just generally speaking, increasing the overall amount of public transportation service in Santa Cruz County. Good, it's 71%, 41%, extremely important, but remember what we saw earlier about that emphasis on getting people to jobs and how important that was specifically compared to just generally speaking increasing. Um, supporting housing and commercial development in the urban areas that, are, that is denser and more walkable. Got about two thirds, so still a priority but lower than some of the others. Um, we start to drift down here, particularly at the prioritization level if we're looking at the dark blue, extremely important when we talk about services for tourists to reduce traffic congestion, and then making some bus service available to every community in the county, even if most people in some communities will not use it, that's actually under 50% in terms of extremely or very important, and you can see that the higher rating here in terms of somewhat important or not very important at all. Okay, now the next section we have four different trade-off questions that we ask people, because all those on the last two slides, they could have said every single thing that we asked them was extremely important, right? They don't have to make trade-offs. You as a board, you have to make trade-offs, right? You don't have an infinite amount of money. Um, there aren't an, an infinite amount of options, so you have, to, you have to decide here. So you can see the text that we told them. We wanted to give them a little bit of background and context, right? Metro is a public agency, spending tax dollars, has a limited number of buses and money to operate them. They have to make hard choices. Um, with that in mind, which of the following options would you prefer? So a, a lot of these choices that we're going to offer them are basically between kind of fast and frequent service compared to a distributed service that has a feeling of fairness because every community that, uh, has some uh, amount of bus service in their area. You can see there's a really strong preference here for frequent service over just broad availability. Uh, in the dark blue, we've got provide fast and frequent service that comes every 15 minutes and takes the most direct routes, even if that means transit's only available in the areas where the most people live and work, or provide service to as many places as possible, even if that means the bus only comes every hour or two and most trips take a long time. Seven, almost 70% want that fast and frequent service where it's going to be used the most. Uh, about 26% say we need to make sure it's, it's broad and everybody has an opportunity. Um, and then beneath that, we looked at the different attitudes, such as they are among people who ride Metro. So you've got the folks who ride once a month, the folks who ride a few times a year, the folks who never ride, and again, the never ride is a larger group than the others. Um, and you can see, while there's some variation, it's pretty consistent. Um, it's well over 60%, up to 70% who are on the side of that fast and frequent service. Um, we also wanted to give them a little more information um, so if the first is sort of a base, think of that as a baseline, then we give them a little bit of, of additional information to see how that changes their opinion. Um, and that's here's um, another way to think about this. When you rely on a bus that doesn't come very often, it's hard to be on time. You might get there early and wait or, or risk being late. Um, now what do you think? And with that additional context, the percentage who would say they would want 
uh, fast and frequent service goes up, now we've got 74% compared to 22%, and again, pretty consistent um, with the non-riders being even more enthusiastic about the idea of that every 15 minute service. Um, thinking about the way that the service impacts the broader community, um, we asked focus more on supporting the local economy by providing fast and frequent service in the areas where many people could use it to get to work, school, shopping, other everyday needs, or the benefits of fairness to all, making sure there's at least a little service to everyone in all communities, even if it's slow and it doesn't come very often. We have 71 to 25, again, on the sort of support the economy perspective here. Um, even stronger among the non-riders at 74%. And actually a little more divided, although still on the, the fast and frequent, or, or supporting the economy side, but uh, among the people who ride most often. Those who would say they ride once a month or more are more like 60-40, um, whereas the non-riders are, are even more enthusiastic at 74 to 21. Um, and then lastly, um, a different set of options for, for them to consider um, focus on the needs of communities where many people have low incomes or don't have reliable access to a personal vehicle compared to provide service equally to all communities regardless of need, income, or access. 72% um, would say focus on the, the low income communities where, and areas where people don't have their own transportation. 25% equally to all. In a similar pattern here where the frequent riders are still on the, that left hand side, the blue side, 60-40, but um, not as much as the people who ride less frequently or don't ride at all, who are at about 73, 74%, saying focus on the needs of, of low-income communities and, and places where people don't have their own personal vehicle. Um, so that's the end of the slides. Michael, do you want to save survey questions for later, or John, or do you want to? I think we have about five minutes. Want to do survey questions now? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, <clears throat> I'm Mike Rodkin, one of the board members. Um, before the uh, pandemic, and I'm not sure how much earlier than the pandemic, we had about six million riders uh, as compared to what we told we have now. When we made uh, difficult decisions about budget cuts, we decided rather than cutting, reducing time, we cut a few weeks out, but primarily what we did was reduce frequency on a lot of rides. And this is not about 15 minute service, this is taking like an hour service bus and making it two, a half an hour to an hour and so forth. I'm trying to get, a, I'm looking at the numbers that you've given us, trying to get a sense of if we were even to restore the frequency we had before we made those difficult cuts to face our fiscal cliff issues, fiscal cliff issues um, would that likely bring back the kinds of, I mean, when you're looking at the issue of like, you know, why, I used to write it before, but now I don't. Mm -hmm. Does the data you have there sort of support the idea that we lost those riders because we cut the frequency? Or is there some, um, is that a reasonable conclusion? Um, I, I, so it's hard for me to, say, to go from here to yeah, as far as you need to go, but I'll give you a, a little bit of context. For the people who said they're riding less frequently now than they were before, and that could include they were riding and now they're not riding at all, or they were going every day and now they're only going a couple times a month, um, when we asked them why, these were some of the answers they gave. So it takes too long to get where I need to go on the bus was the, the number one if we look at both major reason and minor reason. Um, and then that, the bus does not come that, often that, enough. That's a headways issue as opposed to like how often the bus comes. It, it could be, but it could also tell them, it could be they're thinking about the whole trip also. Right, so it's hard to, to get to that level of granularity, but I would say certainly time is a factor, and then in terms of restoration, one of the things I'm, I would be worried about is if people didn't have a car because they were taking the bus, then they um, got a car, yeah. and now you're putting their bus route back, and are, the, are those same people gonna get back on the bus, or is it gonna be new people coming in? I, that I, I don't know. Thanks. Adam, uh, the question I'm worried about being safe from COVID, how does this figure compare with other transit agencies? I've seen numbers that are either similar or higher for other Bay Area I've agencies. seen higher also, yeah. but this is such a time-sensitive question. Good point. Right, I mean, I'm looking at myself and everyone else here with one exception who's not wearing a mask, yeah. right? So three months ago, four months ago, my guess is that would have been higher. Yeah. Um, 
Um, on the same slide around, um, I do not feel as safe on local buses for reasons other than COVID. Do we know what some of those reasons are? Do we go into depth at all? We don't. Uh -huh. No, we just offer them that answer and then they, they fix it. So that's one of the limits of this kind of survey is we can't do a back and forth dialogue and you know open-ended responses that you'd need more of a, a focus group scenario to, to get to. But you were saying that was lower than other areas? It is, and I'm thinking of, of denser urban areas, so if we're talking about an LA, a bigger area like an LA or, or San Francisco, uh, you know, uh, Bay Area larger, you know, that, those tend to be higher. Um, and oftentimes that's related to the folks experiencing mental health crisis or folks experiencing homelessness on buses, right, and, and that's where that driver is. Um, so in this case, that is lower than what I've seen in some other areas. And one other question. Um, we're seeing now, I'm sure everyone is, with the change in the school hours that everyone is having to arrive at 8.30 instead of mm. Stagger, it's had a tremendous impact in our city and, and to where there's safety concerns for the kids and everything. Um, so I'm wondering if that might be something that we'll be looking at planning to see if we can um, not only match or look at the high school writers, but even maybe the middle school writers mm -hmm. to see if we can't address some of those traffic concerns. And, and parents who are sitting in very congested lines might welcome an option. Yeah, and, and we tested the idea, the prioritization of prior, providing transportation to the area's high schools. Um, I wouldn't say it was a top priority, but it's sort of in the middle. I think also as as the school year progresses and more people are experiencing the, the situation you're talking about, that you might see that go up. It might also be more localized to people who have high school students or live near a high school who would really see, oh yeah, this is impacting, this change in hours is really impacting them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. if, um, nearly 70% uh, don't ride Metro. Is that high in general for a community of our size? I mean, we have a broad spectrum of you know, the demographics and stuff like that. But uh, also in the uh, in San Rosa Valley, the Pablo Valley, it's, uh, it's just different terrain too. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there was 47%, uh, the second question was, uh, we don't ride Metro, it's had an unfavorable uh, today. What puts that in your mind? Um, the bus, so the 47% is don't have an opinion. The people who don't ride Metro, but and then 47% of them don't have yeah. an opinion, it's 14% who have an unfavorable opinion, which is pretty consistent with the, the folks who do ride. I think you've got a, a group of people who just really aren't clued in enough to, to know one way or another. Um, in terms of the ridership, I would say it's a, a little high um, in terms of the, the non-riders, although it, it's changing so much in different communities these days. Um, you also have a little bit of variation within your county where ridership is higher in, in, at least in the survey, in the city of Santa Cruz and somewhat in Watsonville than it is in other parts of the county. And so the numbers aren't equally distributed where, you know, if you were to go to every neighborhood, you would find the same percentages of people who ride the bus and who don't ride. Yeah. I, would, I would just add, um, from the unfavorable, at least in terms of what people call and write and get up and public meetings and speak about the idea that we want empty buses, uh, you know, your, your service is not, I can't use it, it doesn't run around, whatever. Right. But that's probably, how, how, why do 14% think it's a bad system? Because they, they think that the UCSD buses come down and go empty in the morning. Um, we, we, we run empty buses all over the way. And you hear about that a lot. Yeah, and that may be, and, and again, it's one of the things we, we didn't have the space to probe much further. I'd also say, you're never going to have a public agency that has zero unfavorability, <laughs> right? It's not going to happen. So, 14% is pretty good. So we set aside 30 minutes uh, after Jared's presentation if we can hold the rest of the conversation. Really, thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we were hoping that would set the stage and spark discussion uh, and provide. Valuable information for uh, the next speaker and the broader service planning effort that we have to follow. So I'm going to introduce Jared Walker. Uh, he's an international consultant in public transit network design and policy based in Portland, Oregon. 
He has been a full-time consultant since 1991 and has led numerous major planning projects in cities and towns of all sizes across North America, Australia, and New Zealand. He's also the author of Human Transit, uh, How Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives. So he literally wrote the book on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> he is president of Jarrett Walker & Associates, a consultant firm that provides advice and planning services in North America. Uh, he has a BA from Pomona College, as do I, and a PhD in theater arts and humanities at Stanford University. I do not have that. <laughs> uh, I'm passionately interested in a practical number of fields. He is probably the only person with peer-reviewed publications in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. Please welcome Jared Walker. Thank you very much. And that was, thank you, Adam. That was really helpful in setting up some things for us to talk about here. So, um, I'm, um, I've been asked to do a quick survey of um, sort of some basic principles of transit planning that are, that are going to give you a sense of decisions you should expect to have to make and consequences of those decisions. I always want to start with a, a couple of quick things about why fixed transit and why buses, just because you all need to be able to have these conversations with your constituents and respond to some of the common comments we hear about that. So um, the case for public transit, there are several cases for public transit, but the one that is always going to be there and that is irreducible is that it's about the efficient use of space, and which is why cities that have less space per person, denser cities need transit more, and that's pretty much an iron law. Um, this is 100 people and how much space they take if they're in a bus, how much space they take on bicycles, and how much space they take if they're in cars. Congestion is what happens when we travel by a space in efficient mode and therefore get in each other's way. One way to think of congestion is that when we use space inefficiently, we end up waiting in line to use it because we need more of it than there is. And so if you think of congestion as essentially waiting in line, uh, that's all because, because you're waiting for something scarce. That's often a useful way to think about it. Um, is this going to do this thing for me? There we go. Technology never changes geometry. Uh, we are enormous amounts of venture capital are being spent uh, making us believe that various kinds of technology are going to make transit obsolete or make it completely different or whatever. Here's how much space 60 people take if they're on a bus. There we go. Here's how much space they take if they're in private cars. Here's how much space they take if they're in a taxi or an Uber or Lyft. Here's how much space they take if they're in driverless cars. <laughs> and so the point being, none of those things are really touching the geometric fact we're talking about. If we, ever, if we ever had a driverless bus, that would be different. But that's some way off. So the thing to remember is that in dense cities and cities wanting to be dense, or cities that are going to be dense maybe to some extent, whether they entirely want to or not, um, transit is existential. So be careful whenever anyone tells you that new ideas and technologies are disrupting fixed draft transit. The case for fixed draft transit is geometric and technology never changes geometry. Um, now what's a bus? People have all sorts of attitudes about buses. People often want to start the conversation about buses with a demographic conversation. Who uses the bus? From the standpoint of an, of, of an elected official, it sometimes feels natural to sort of organize your thinking in terms of groups of constituents and to imagine that there is a group of constituents who are bus people and who are those people that they like. It's important if you're going to see the full potential of buses to not think that way, or at least to not think entirely that way, and to work with a very capacious, large definition of what, a, of what everything a bus can be. Buses, door buses are all kinds of things in particular, but the definition of a bus is very, is, is, it, there's enormous room in it for you to do lots of different things and for buses to be different things. A bus is public transit, capable of high ridership, in other words, not a car, using roads rather than rails. And that's all it is. And buses around the world are very diverse. There are, are 
incredibly um, um, miserable bus systems. They're magnificent and luxurious bus systems. I won't say luxurious in the sense of exclusive, but very, very nice bus services that lots of people use. I was just riding them in Seattle the other day. You can do all kinds of things with it, but it is important to not get trapped in a demographic view of buses that says, because this is who uses buses, that is who is going to use buses. And that's always the danger when you start with the notion that these people are bus people, which is, in my experience, where some elected officials start. So I want to encourage you not to start there. Having a little difficulty with this clicker. There we go. Um, bus service is a climate solution because it's the fastest and most effective way to make transit useful to more people in more situations um, through its low capital cost and fast implementation. I'm not expressing a view about a train project for you. I'm just saying that buses are really a are, are really efficient way to move rapidly on this. They're also an equity solution because they can scale affordably to cover most of the city's people and destinations if that's what you want to do it. One of the challenges you will have if you move forward with a rail project, and I'm not telling you you should or shouldn't, is that a single expensive piece of infrastructure doesn't go to everywhere in the county. It will be in this neighborhood and but not in that neighborhood. And you will have to have a story about how everyone benefits from it, whether they're near a station or not. And that's why I've been through a lot of um, funding battles and, and you know, uh, ballot measures about transit funding. And the ones that have succeeded have been the ones that had a story about, here's this cool piece of infrastructure we're building, but here is the total network that explains how everybody has access to that infrastructure and benefits from it, even if they're not next to a station. So, um, I want to talk now about how we measure success, because there is a, um, there are lots of different ways to measure success out there lots of different ways people talk about success in public transit. And I want to introduce a particular way of talking about it that we have found very powerful and that we've particularly been using in all of our studies for the last five years or so. And, the, and when you think about how you want to, ex how you would go about expanding range, there is a theory that says this is essentially a marketing problem. And so we need to go and find out who our potential market is, find out, you know, learn about the people who could potentially shift to be writers, learn more about their needs and preferences and design around that. That's not wrong, but it's very complicated. <laughs> and it draws us into a lot of uncertainties. And it, it puts us in the position of claiming to know perhaps more than we really know about how individuals are actually going to respond to their options. The other way to do it is that rather than trying to predict what people are going to do, there's another way we can do it, which is to simply expand what people could do. And that's called freedom analysis or access analysis, and that's what I want to talk about. Now, freedom's a big, grand, fancy word. I know you have a street named after it here. And um, that's, but I'm going to talk about freedom as something very quantifiable, something that we can actually measure. The other word for it is access or accessibility. You'll hear me using both words. The idea is the image of a wall around your life. This thing is failing, um, so I'm going to have to stand over here, I think. Okay. Can people hear me if I stand here? Yeah, yeah this thing is not working. Okay. Um, so the basic idea is this. Here's a person. She's in a city that's full of possible destinations, places she could shop, places she could work, places she could worship, places she could have a social life, and so on, places she could study. Given the network as it is, in 45 minutes, say, there's an area she could get to. This is what I mean by the wall around her life. We only have a certain amount of time to make certain kinds of trips. And if we can't make those trips in that amount of time, Places beyond that wall are simply not available for us. So her access to opportunity is simply the number of destinations, of useful destinations that are in that area. We can measure that. We can measure it getting bigger or smaller. Here's an example from our network redesign project in Dublin, Ireland, which we finished a few years ago and is being implemented now. So 
you imagine a person in a hypothetical location, she's asking, where could I be in 45 minutes? Which is really the equivalent of asking, where could I work? Where could I study? Where could I do all kinds of things that involve a trip of about what that length, where that kind of travel time is reasonable? And so there's an area that she could reach now. There's an area that she could reach under the proposed network. And I can calculate the difference. I can calculate exactly how many more jobs she could get to. Or if she's actually a destination, I could calculate how many more people could get to her. So from the perspective of a business, for example, or an employer, it's helpful to think about it that way also. So I'm in the position now to say, Jane at this location is 43% free. If by freedom we mean the presence of meaningful options in our lives, right? If we mean the availability of options, the ability to choose to do one thing or another, that's really what I'm talking about. Um, the, now the interesting thing about this calculation, uh, in the survey that you just discussed, and in a lot of the conversations you'll have, you'll hear about opinions about each of the three parts of a transit trip, and you'll hear about them separately. So the walk, that's a conversation about walking distance and walking infrastructure. The wait, which is a conversation about frequency. And the ride, which is a conversation about speed and reliability. And also about rapid readiness and a couple of other things. It's normal for people, especially people who are more experienced transit riders or who know something about transit, to express individual opinions about each of these things. But freedom analysis is just interested in some of those three things. And we know, as transit planners, that people routinely trade off one of these for another. For example, people walk further to a more frequent service, not for a psychological reason, but simply because they're optimizing their total travel time. And the optimal total travel time often arises from walking, walking further to wait less. So that's why freedom analysis invites us to focus more on the total and less on forming opinions about each of the parts. Now, there will be people who are not with us on this. There will be uh, older people, people with disabilities who have a different experience of the walk than the rest of us do. So I don't want to say that this is the answer for everyone. But this kind of analysis does tend to capture pretty well what the overwhelming majority of people tend to optimize, which is not each part of the trip separately, but the sum of them. <coughs> Now, here's the cool thing. When I'm talking about freedom or access, another word for this is usefulness. So if you imagine somebody looking up, somebody has a trip they want to make, and they're curious whether they can make it on transit, and they look it up on your trip planner. What are the odds that the trip planner is going to tell them that the travel time on transit is reasonable? That is also what we measure when we measure access. Because by expanding the number of destinations that are within a reasonable travel time, that's the same thing as saying increasing the odds that when a person looks up a particular trip, they will find a reasonable travel time. And that is the foundation of ridership. There are all sorts of other things that are important to ridership, but if you don't have this, you're not going to be considered anything. Now, the other thing about cool thing about talking about access is that at the same time, that it has this fundamental role in ridership, it's also doing all sorts of other things that are important to people. Remember that first page of the survey that Adam showed you, talking about all the different kinds of benefits of transit to the community. More than 50% telling you that almost all of those things were highly important to them. That's a very good sign for if you ever go to the motors, by the way. Um, well, we can actually measure benefits for some of those things. Access to economic opportunity and actually the functionality of the city. An economist would tell you that a city is, that the whole purpose of a city is for people to have access to things. The reason people live in cities instead of rural areas is so that many things are available in a short travel time. And for that reason, travel time is often described by economists as one of the most fundamental measures of the viability of the city, economic functionality of the city. But we're also talking, for example, about the value of investments that are made in a walkable community when people choose to locate, or, or where, where we make it possible for people to locate in places where lots of things are nearby. And finally, of course, it's simply personal freedom, which 
in addition to all the other things we get out of it from a policy standpoint, is also something that needs no justification. It's something everybody wants and everybody values. Now, the relationship between access and ridership, here's the thing. That experience somebody has of finding that the travel time is reasonable when they look up a trip, that's something that's going to endure. Ridership is volatile. It's going to keep going up and down for some other reasons. Right? Obviously, we all saw in March 2020, when ridership fell 80% or whatever, it didn't mean that transit was suddenly 80% less important or 80% less relevant, or the transit agencies were 80% less competent all of which are reasons to be careful about letting your ridership be read as the only measure of your value or your success. Ridership is volatile. It's very much affected by the cost and attractiveness of people's alternatives. So in the late teens, as we all knew, there was, no, there was there tended to be a somewhat downward trajectory of ridership even before we got to COVID. There were reasons for that having to do with what was happening with the economics of driving having to do with what was happening with Uber and Lyft, which were essentially venture capital subsidized competitors operating below their actual cost, so as to give the illusion of being more um, viable than they actually are. That's mostly over. Uber and Lyft fares in fact are closer to what they will need to be to be profitable, and as a result, Uber and Lyft are not as effectively competing with transit as they used to be. That kind of stuff is going to keep happening. Economic contexts are going to keep changing. But the thing about access is that it's an enduring thing. It's the thing that stays constant and that is kind of the foundation of what you're doing, even as the consequences of ridership inevitably go up and down a bit with internal factors. So when we talk about access, I'm essentially isolating the impact of the network design from a lot of other factors that will also affect ridership. Access, as I mentioned, is a geometric fact. I really like to stress this because when you understand that you're looking at a geometric fact, it helps you sort out what is actually a valid argument about it. Right? Um, social science is wonderful, but it doesn't touch geometry. So the calculation from a network to the access outcome is a purely mathematical calculation because it's about what's possible. It's not about who people are. It's about what they could do. The journey from access to a ridership prediction is social science. It's a whole lot more debatable. And there's a whole lot of challenge around the whole idea of prediction. Now, I'm a bit of a radical in our profession. Most of my colleagues and competitors are much more eager to make predictions than I am. And to say, hey, we have a, we have a great computer algorithm here that will tell you what your ridership will be. I believe very strongly that, we, that prediction is pretty much impossible that you know, the, the assumption behind most predictive models is that the future is a road in the central valley. And the road is nice and straight, and we can see way out ahead of ourselves. And maybe one thing will change, but we can have this background assumption that almost everything else is going to stay the same so that we can look at this one thing we study. I think the future is more like Highway 9. I think the future is a squiggly road in the forest. And that's what we've been experiencing lately with surprises, <laughs> and you can't see around curves. Nobody's predictive model can see around curves. And that's made me, and again, I'm a bit of a radical in, in my profession, that's made me really interested in how to figure out how to talk about the value of what we do without prediction. Because I don't really believe anybody's predictions, and I don't particularly want people to believe mine. And so that's one of the other cool things about stopping with access and talking about access as a value, rather than what conventional transportation planning does, which is to calculate access inside the black box, but then immediately to rush ahead to a prediction, assuming that that's what people want. So how do we maximize access when we design a network that expands people's access or freedom, which is also, by the way, how we design an a network to maximize ridership? What exactly are we doing? What's the recipe? The recipe is high frequency lines forming a connected network, reasonably fast and reliable, and focused on transit friendly places. Let me talk about those a little bit. Fortunately, I've already heard a lot of conversation about frequency today. Sounds like the concept of frequency 
is fairly well understood, so I won't spend too much time on it. Notice frequency is a cubed value, which is to say it does three logically independent good things. It's reduced weighting. It's also easier connections. When two lines cross on the map, high frequency lines means you can actually get off of one bus and onto the other, which means that you can, which means that this route is useful for going to all of those places. That's not true at low frequency. And finally, reduced impact of disruptions. Bus breaks down, the next bus will be long. So that's why lines with higher frequency tend not to just have higher ridership, but higher ridership per unit of service. Now, I have to show you a chart, but this is really interesting and it's worth taking a moment of. So every time my firm does a study of some transit network somewhere, we take the route by route data from this network and keep dumping it into this database and growing this database. So each of these is a route in some American city. And higher frequency is to the left. So 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they're 10 minutes. On the y-axis is productivity, passenger boardings divided by quantity of service. Now, as we go to the left, quantity of service is going up, right? Higher frequency is we're running more and more service. That ought to be pulling the ratio back, shouldn't it? <laughs> but it's not. In fact, the ratio goes, the, the relationship goes the other way. You may even detect a slight upward curvature in the relationship. In other words, there's a highly exponential payoff frequency that actually compensates for the fact that frequency is more expensive. And it particularly starts happening in this range of better than 30 and especially down to 15 minute frequencies. Now let me be careful. I am not making this claim as a time sequence claim. I'm not saying that if you double the frequency, you will immediately get more than double the ridership. Because the other thing that's going on here is land use. Higher frequency routes tend to be in places where there's more stuff around the line. But I am saying that if you develop those things together, if you were developing frequency at the same time that you were developing your form around the frequency, then you can expect these kind of factors. So this is very surprising and powerful. Now this is why there is so much frequent network-oriented land use planning. This is something that's really changed over the last couple of decades. 20 years ago, around the turn of the century, most architects and developers would have told you that if you want transit that generates and supports any kind of density, you just have, it has to be rail. What matters is that we're next to a train station. And now I think it's much more understood that if you want to support high density, you need to be in a high freedom location. <clears throat> and frequency is one of the most visible parts of that. Now remember, it has three parts, walk, wait, and ride. We're just talking about one of them, which is the weight. But it's still an overwhelming one. The weight, the weight also needs to be talked about a little more than the walk and the ride, because it's harder to explain to people who are themselves motorists, or I might add, cyclists. People who use a personal vehicle that is ready to go whenever they are, will often undervalue frequency and not really be aware of how frequency, the weight, makes transit so fundamentally different from personal vehicle options like your car or your bicycle. Sometimes I will use the, well, sometimes when I know I'm talking to a largely suburban constituency who mostly lives in nice homes behind the gates, I'll say, imagine having a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour, and you can only get your car out once an hour. That's what the transit experience is like, and that's what frequency is. So, Metro Vancouver, obviously a fantastically dense place, but has been working for 20 years on a goal of the form, half the population of jobs will be on a frequent network. This is a goal they adopted in 2007, and I think they actually achieved it within a few years, and are now continuing to develop beyond that. I can talk about um, my hometown, Portland, Oregon, where the frequent service network, which has been defined from about, for about 20 years, and frequent service, by the way, the idea here is not just the US service every 15 minutes, but there's a brand associated you're making that really visible. And you, des you designate something as frequent service when you're pretty sure it's always going to be there. Right? You want people to feel a sense of permanence about it in the way that people have a sense of permanence about rail. One of the cool things, and by the way, as you'll notice in the background there, we in Portland are generally starting to line frequent service routes with three to four story buildings, pretty much containers. Now, so we have the market for that. 
But there's a relationship, very importantly, to affordability. So one of the cool things about building high density next to frequent network, next to the frequent network, is that you're encouraging people to sort themselves out through their own location choice based on whether transit is something that they value. And what you want to make sure of is that everybody who would like to lead a, lead a transit-oriented lifestyle can afford to live in a place like that. That people are not living in a hard-to-reach cul-de-sac out on the edge of Watsonville where we can't get frequent transit to them very effectively. That they're not living out there because it's the only place they can afford to live. There needs to be a place they can afford to live that involves choosing transit if they want to choose that. Remember, their freedom is still fundamentally new for going to lower so one of the cool things about the frequent network is that it's useful enough to be really liberating, as we can measure with access analysis. It's also, but we can also make it abundant enough that it can't possibly drive up housing prices everywhere the way rail has sometimes tended to do. You know, rail, rail investments have sometimes produced really, really disproportionate spikes in real estate value around the stations. Again, not expressing a view about a rail project here, um, but a reason to continue to care about the bus network. The other thing, of course, is that it makes it even easier to build apartments with less parking, which is absolutely foundational to affordability. Mandatory parking, and of course, we know what's happening with state land use law here. In general, in this state, you're already being pushed in this direction. But building apartments with less parking makes the apartments more affordable, and also tends to mean that they can generate higher density and be closer together without generating the kinds of traffic impacts that make people react badly. Um, I should add that I'm making an assumption here. I imagine there are different opinions in the room about exactly how dense your community should become. And, but I am, I am assuming that since I don't see any spare horizontal buildable land in this county, I see built up land and then I see some mountains, I am figuring that any particular growth here is pretty much going to have to take the form of density. And obviously, I'm assuming that given the affordability crisis that has already been cited once here, there's going to have to be some supply side solution to that. So those are the only assumptions I'm making. I don't want to wait any further into local debates you may be having about that. So let's look at where you are with frequency. Now, this is where you were before the pandemic. Every map that my firm draws will draw frequency with colors with the red line meaning 15 minute service, the dark blue line meaning 30, the pale blue line meaning 60, and pale, green, pale gold lines meaning worse than 60. So um, at the moment, of course, you're not running that red line up to the university. You're also running essentially a 30 minute service up there that has to do with driver availability. But this was the standard form of the network before the pandemic, and if, if you're Staffing problems disappear tomorrow. My assumption is you'd snap back to this for now. 30 minute services, Soquel Boulevard Local, two paths into Watsonville, San Lorenzo Valley. But notice, most of East Side Santa Cruz and Capitola, local routes every hour. Much of West Side Santa Cruz, local routes every hour. Watsonville, several local routes every hour or less. Now, this is important because we're talking about relatively short routes. We're talking about just back and forth inside of Santa Cruz, or just back and forth between Santa Cruz and Capitola, or just around inside of Watson. Now, the sensitivity to, to frequency is particularly high if you're making a relatively short trip. It doesn't make sense to wait very long to go not very far. Right? That's why you'll wait two hours for a flight to LA, but you'll wait a day for a flight to London. Same principle, right? You won't wait as long for a smaller trip. That's not a psychological insight. That's actually just an access calculation. It doesn't contribute very much access to use an infrequent service for a short trip because the waiting time is most of the travel time. And at some point, it becomes faster just to walk. You can, if you think about if you've just missed an hourly bus in Watsonville to go two miles, most people can walk those two miles in an hour. Why would you wait for the next bus? So, it's interesting when I look especially both at parts of Watsonville and at the parts of Santa Cruz and Capitola that you see marked with the pale blue lines here, there's some fairly dense areas there. That's not just you know, low density sprawl. A lot of that's historic fabric with some significant you know, decent density to it that you're just not there for. Right 
So that's interesting. That's what you want. So now the other part of this is where does high ridership transit go? So because frequency is expensive, we're going to if if we if you choose with a network design to put frequency in a certain place, such that you generate really high access from certain places. The overall benefit of that depends on there being lots of people at those places or going to those places. Now I showed you the diagrams from Dublin about that particular place where Jane got 43% more freedom as a result of our plan. We also had a city-wide sound bite that was the average Dubliner, averaged across the entire population, not just Jane, can get to 16% more jobs and educational opportunities in 45 minutes. That was our headline sound bite. So average Dubliner is, I would say, 16% free. That average, of course, is maximized by there being lots of people in the places where the access is best. And that happens by thinking about transit together with land use, and even more importantly, thinking about land use together with transit. So there are four key features of a land use pattern that matter. And again, I'm giving you these simple geometry diagrams because I want you to be aware that I'm talking about geometry. I'm not talking about social science. I'm not talking about demographics. I'm not talking about culture. This is important because I am now about to say that one neighborhood is better than another neighborhood at supporting transit. And it's very important when we all say this that we not sound like we're saying that this neighborhood is just better than that neighborhood or these people are better than those people, which is how some people will tend to take it. So we have to be very clear that we're not talking about who you are. We're just talking about where you are and the pattern of, of the development that you live in, the pattern of the streets that you live in, and the way that governs what's possible. Density is the easiest. <laughs> These two bus routes have the same cost to operate. They both have two buses on them. But one of them has twice as many people around every stop. So of course, twice as many people around every stop means that even if everybody uses transit at the same rate, that's twice as much, right? But what's more, it's a little more nonlinear than that, because when people live at high density, they start to have other reasons to not use cars as much. More stops in walking distance, parking is more of a hassle. That's why the, the relationship between density and transit ridership tends to be a little nonlinear. But at the very least, it's linear because there are simply more people. That's what density is. Walkability. Can the people around the stop actually get to the stop? Now, um, this is two different, in these two diagrams here, the dot in the center is a transit stop. And the circle is a quarter mile radius out of that transit stop. And the black lines are places in that circle where you could actually walk to the stop in the quarter mile given the street. So in a good, well-connected grid, about two-thirds of the, of the um, area can get to the stop in that amount of time. If you have a fragmented, uh, cul-de-sac-oriented uh, neighborhood with lots of obstacles, you can easily get that down to less than a third. So if I'm thinking in access maximizing terms, and I'm looking at that lower development pattern, well, it, there, there might as well just be fewer people there. There may be people in the quarter mile radius, but if they can't actually get to the stop given the barriers, they might as well not be there. The other very important thing is that it must be possible to cross the street at every stop. This is a very important conversation between you and Caltrans and between you and your public works departments. Because if you put the stops on opposite sides of the street where it is not safe to cross, you have provided one-way service because the transit is always going to take you from this side of the street and bring you back to that side of the street. So that's another critical thing that we're looking at. And so again, as a transit planner, if I'm sitting down working on a project where nobody wants my opinion about the land use, but I'm expected to design a high ridership transit system to it, I'm going to react negatively to that lower, um, to that lower development pattern. I'm going to react negatively to a big, fast street without crosswalks every quarter mile or so. Those are going to tell me lower ridership potential overall. Now, linearity. <laughs> Density and walkability are things that architects and developers and most city planners understand. Linearity is a uniquely plan is, is, is uniquely transit's problem. And as a result, a lot of people don't understand it and don't consider it. 
here are two different ways that a community might be configured, a community of the same four land use patterns. So if they're all in a straight line, and I've got a reasonable path, reasonably straight path connecting them, then that's an optimal situation in terms of ridership because it's an optimal situation in terms of access. Because transit dri drives the shortest possible distance to connect them all, and transit drives a straight path that is perceived as a reasonably direct path between any two points. This is why SoCal Avenue is a good transit corridor, is that there's lots of stuff in something that people experience as more or less a straight line. This is why a hospital on a hilltop is a really bad transit problem. A giant university on a hilltop is arguably a bad transit problem, although some universities are so big that we go ahead and deal with them. But you're very <laughs> But you are, I cannot tell you how fortunate you are to have Cabrillo College where it is, instead of, say, where Cal State Hayward is, which is up on a hilltop at the end of a long road, where you have to drive up there and turn around and come back. You can't go anywhere else via that destination because of where it is. So discouraging future institutional development in the cul de sacs is a really important thing because they create enormous problems for transit once they get built. By and large, you're pretty fortunate in this regard. But you know, the other similar examples, the Walmart behind a quarter mile of parking, um, a lot of other things that you know, you can, we, we see a lot of, you know, if you go over the hills here, you're mostly pretty fortunate in that regard, but I'm sure you can think of examples. Basically, that lower way of organizing the same for land uses means the bus drives further to follow a more circuitous path which therefore slows down the thirst of people already on the bus. It's a lose-lose all the way across. It's a lose for the passengers and it's a lose for the transitors. So this is one of those things where ultimately we need to be educating people about the consequences of their location. I'm having a great, I'm having this conversation in Portland right now. We have two small exclusive liberal arts colleges. One of them is on the frequent network, on the way to other places. The other one is in a cul-de-sac. And they're asking me, well, why do they get free? Why does that other college, our rival across town that we compare ourselves to all the time, you know, why are they getting frequent network and, and service? And I'm having to explain it has nothing to do with who you are. It has nothing to do with anything about you except just where you are. You're in a cul-de-sac. They're not. They're on the way to things. You're not. Therefore. You have to support all your bus service all by yourself, whereas their market for bus service is created not just by them, but by lots of other people going the same direction, which is why they get more bus. Bad linearity. You, some of you may have may have traumatic memories of this route. This is the sort of thing. <laughs> Um, my understanding is you're not running this particular pattern anymore, but this is the sort of thing that happens when you have an extremely non-linear community and you have an expectation of covering every part of that community. We'll come back to coverage in a moment. There's different things going on there. But as we know, as we get into the hills, we start to get lots of cul-de-sac neighborhood patterns here where there is one road into them and all you can do is drive into them and go around in them and then come back down. Very, very, a very negative for the ability to provide high ridership transit. So this is the sort of line that you look at and you look at what's on it, and you would say, this is not a high ridership line. It is geometrically impossible for this to be a high ridership line. Don't run this line if your goal is ridership, but as we'll talk about, there may be other reasons to run it. Finally, just proximity, all other things being equal, it costs more to go a long distance, right? This is why there's more service from Salinas to Monterey than there is from Salinas to Watsonville. It has to do with just there's just a big empty space between Salinas and Watsonville with not much there. And as a result, um, there's, there's, there, it, it cannot be as much of a priority. By the way, we just did the network we designed for MST, so moderate county is fresh in our mind. Um, happy to talk about those examples. So now the important question is, if you're trying to optimize access overall, which is how you optimize ridership overall, are you, what do you actually do? Well. The, you have to stop and ask, is ridership actually what you want? It's easy to say, yes, of course, ridership is what we want, until you look at the actual trade-offs involved, and then it turns out to be a somewhat harder decision. So this is a little like plumbing. If you hire a plumber, and he goes to work under your sink, and he comes back, 
and he's holding his wrench, and he says, look, I could glue this all together like this, and it would last another year or so, and it would cost $50, or I could rip out the whole assembly and replace it. It'd be just like new in the last 10 years, and then it cost $500. So he's giving you a choice between cheap and durable. And here's the thing. You have to answer his question exactly the way he phrased it. You cannot say, pick up a magazine and start talking in general about what the, the look and feel you'd like to have in your kitchen. He's going to stand there with his wrench and wait for you to answer his question exactly the way he asked it, cheap or durable, hence your choices. That's really important because your transit planner, your staff, John here, they're like the plumber. They're going to present you with choices and they're choices about your values, but you have to answer those those questions in the form that they ask him. Because until you answer the plumber's question in the form that he asked him, he's not going to be able to do it, to, to take your ideas and turn them into a plan. So that's the one. Okay. So here's a simple fictional town. The dots are people or jobs. So in this particular fictional town, most of the people in jobs and destinations are along two straight streets, and everyone else is scattered. And let's say I have 18 buses to design a network for this town. So my first question is, okay, what's your goal? Ridership, 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 okay. If you want ridership, I'll do this. I'll take all 18 buses and I'll put them on the two main streets. And as a result, I will provide excellent access for about 70% of the population and zero access to the rest of the population, but that will give us the highest average access across the city, which is the basis for having the highest ridership. Right? This is how we optimize by averaging across the city. Mrs. Jones in the southeast corner of the city does not like this idea. And that's because she feels entitled to a certain amount of service, or she needs a certain amount of service, even though she lives in a low density, maybe unwalkable place. And so rather than saying that there's something wrong with Mrs. Jones, or that Mrs. Jones's needs aren't important, or that, um, or something like that, I have found it more powerful just to, and more accurate just to say, that there's an opposite goal, which is coverage, that is what Mrs. Jones and many other people are advocating. And the idea of the coverage goal is that the top priority is to get a little bit of service to everyone. Think how easy it is to adopt a statement, a statement like access for all or leave no one behind. It just rolls off our tongues. It's very easy to say. But this is what you're saying, <laughs> right? You're saying spend enough on going everywhere that you get to everyone. But to do this, I take my 18 buses. Now I have 10 routes instead of two, so I've spread those buses across all those routes, and now these buses only come once an hour, whereas the other buses get every, every 10 minutes. Because these buses only come once an hour, they're probably not coming when you need them, therefore not very many people use them, therefore the ridership is there. I can also describe this in access terms. The average access across the city is now more uniform geographically, but it is also much lower for everyone, and so the average access across the city. So here's the thing. Both of these goals have a lot of people behind them and are tied to a lot of important public policy outcomes that people care about. Ridership goal, we're thinking like a business. We're supporting dense and walkable development because high ridership service will go there and will focus there anyway. Be by virtue of maximizing ridership, we're maximizing competition with cars, we're maximizing EMT reduction, Somebody who's thinking financially might also want to say that we're maximizing fare rate. That's also true if you're charging fares. So the coverage goal is thinking like a public service, access for all, support for low density development, lifeline access for everyone, leave no one behind. Now, what I want you to what I want to be clear here is that when you are doing a service change proposal, and every time somebody comes before you and says, I need the bus here, my life will not be possible without this bus you're in the presence of someone legitimately proposing coverage-based plan, right? Don't think of that as just them being selfish. They're just proposing this other perfectly valid goal for public transit, which is coverage. So it helps to choose a point on the spectrum. And this is the question that's eventually going to come back around to you. So right now, you're about 60-40, which is to say, and I'm sorry, this is actually an analysis of your pre-COVID network, because I'm going to assume that that is, for now, by default, what you would snap back to if you had it first. 
About 60% of your service is where it would be if the goal were covered, and about 40% is not. Oh, sorry, it's about, well, it's 60 percent is about where it would be if the goal were ridership, and about 40 percent is not. So that gives you a sense of a starting point. Think about there now being a dial on your dashboard that you could turn left or right, depending on what you want, or ridership. Um, so, for example, services that are clearly ridership services in your network are clearly. Um, anything going to the, to the university, but also the Santa Cruz Watsonville corridor, and in particular the Soquel corridor, that involves the Rio College, not just the Express corridor, and San Lorenzo Valley, which when I first started studying this network, I was surprised at how well San, San Lorenzo Valley does. But it's denser than it looks, and um, it, it actually does very well. Coverage services, basically all the time that you are driving around once an hour, because hourly service has the unique ability to get terrible ridership out of absolutely any land use planning. <laughs> and um, and most rural services. So I'm just going to quickly take you through a case study, and then I'm going to stop. We did this whole exercise at VTA across the across the hills here, and I'll just quickly take you through what it looked like because it's something you may want to consider doing yourselves as part of the study that's coming up. <clears throat> so they had a pre-existing all-day frequency. Again, red means the high-frequency network, but you can also see the whole extent of the network. They asked for three concepts, 70%, 80%, and 90% ridership. The coverage is 100 minus that is how much gets spent on the coverage. Again, those colors. So there was the existing frequency, and we designed three concepts. 70, see the red lines, but also see all the coverage of the network. 80, 90. By the time you get to 90, it's almost all red lines, and a lot of the coverage has disappeared. I'll show you those again. Previous network, 70, 80, 90. Okay? Now, you see why we draw, why we have to use those colors, because otherwise it would just look like we were cutting service, right? Actually, no, we're reallocating service, and the colors are the payoff, the high frequency network. So now here's the thing. I don't need to explain, lots of people are never going to quite understand frequency, um, but I can explain this in terms of access. So from the standpoint of somebody at a particular intersection in northern Santa Clara, this, these access diagrams show you in concentric blobs where you can go in 15, 30, 45, or 60 minutes. Those are the colors. The outermost color, the pink, is 60 minutes. There's the existing network, concept 70, 29% more jobs reachable in 30 minutes, concept 80, concept 90. By the time you get to concept 90, the blob has expanded enormously. And we've doubled the number of jobs reached for in 30 minutes. One of the interesting things to notice, by the way, going on right here, is that this east-west corridor has appeared as being reachable. Now that, in a high-frequency grid, she doesn't have a direct route to those places. What she has is a frequent-to-frequent -frequent connection. Because in concept 90, that north-south route is very frequent, and the east-west route is very frequent. As a result, it's fast to connect. As a result, those areas start appearing inside of the wall around her life. So this is a number that takes very little effort to explain to most people, and including to most policymakers. Because when I phrase it in those terms, expanding the number of jobs reachable in a fixed amount of time, I don't have to explain frequency. I'm just talking about the sum effect of walking, waiting, and riding of what transit's achieved. Almost done. First of all, you do not have very much transit here. So if in this forthcoming study you decide to go forward with an exercise about how to, how to reapportion uh, resources within the existing fixed budget, you're going to find that to be a very challenging conversation because there aren't a lot of resources and it will, and it will be, and we had this experience in the VTA. Many, many people in the VTA community are still mad at me or are trying, trying to blame me or frame me as some sort of uh, neoliberal austerity advocate like I've just come out of McKinsey or something. Um, and so that's, that's one of the occupational hazards of my job. But you're going to get a certain amount of this as you go into that process, as you start talking about moving things around and potentially, you know, if you remove some people's service. Um, what you can afford right now is a network of mostly 30 to 60 minute rounds. And to either grow frequency without coverage or grow coverage without cutting frequency, 
you'd need more resources, and that's going to be another part of your conversation. But again, so there's, so there's this question about what you do with the current fixed budget, and then there's also the question about whether this budget is adequate. One of the interesting things about this process is that trying to think about how to properly allocate services within a fixed budget will often help more people come to the conclusion that the budget simply isn't adequate. Um, because it will help more people see that you are, in fact, up to the limits of what you can do. You can do more of this, you can do more of that. Everyone wants more of it. I'll end up by referring back to a couple of things in Adam's presentation. He's already given you a first blush at a public response to this. He, he queried the ridership coverage trade-off essentially almost in those words. And what he got back was basically 70% support for a greater focus on ridership and, about, and uh, the rest for coverage. So already you could say you have 70% support for you know, potentially moving some resources from coverage to ridership and enduring the complaints of the people who are affected by that. That isn't necessarily what you should do, but it is one point of reference in figuring that out. The other thing I want to call out from, from what he just presented is that when he went through the most common things in, that people value out of public transit, things that are valuable to the entire community, you got a long list of things that more than 50 people percent more than 50% said that they strongly value. And that's a very positive signal if at some point you decide to look for more money. So thanks very much, and let's have comments and questions and discussion. So I'm a county supervisor in the Live Oak and uh, Live Oak SoCal area. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got the poor SoCal Drive going right through, great, um, great service and, and good frequency today. And then we've got some of those lighter blue lines going through. Um, mm -hmm. How would you redesign service in that area um, with a focus on ridership? I mean, would you have like a circulator through the area to get people between SoCal Drive and the coast, you know, or would you just have two linear lines? We're talking or would you here, just right? Right? Uh, No, actually, we're a little further to the left. Yeah, there, because the light yeah, okay. so where, yeah. where the land comes a little further out. Yeah. So further, further west. <laughs> so we're getting toward Capitol. Yeah, with the 60-minute frequency lines. All right, in here. Light blue lines. Yeah, 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 in that, here. That, that well. Okay. Well, that's very hard. And we'd have to have, I mean, it would be an interesting conversation. And I'm not going to give you a network design without having studied a lot more data. But um, one extreme solution would be that you'd figure out how to have just one east-west route here, south of SoCal Drive. And you'd have the argument about where it should be so that you could get that route up to a higher frequency. And people would walk further to better service. But I'll tell you, this area is really hard because there's quite a bit of density there. It's mostly small lot, single family, as I remember. It's not big mansions. Um, there's a fair amount of difficulty in the street network. There's a lot of discontinuity in the street network. But there are a series of reasonably useful east-west streets. And it's awfully hard to choose among. And so I don't know what you'll do. Because then the other question will be, to what extent is the high ridership solution for the whole network just to put more frequency on SoCal Drive and not even try to be covering some of these areas? Those will be the kinds of questions that will come up. So your balance of ridership and coverage, what is your experience where someone chooses more coverage, but that actually improves ridership because more people that are covered start to, if they can get to those main areas, just do you see any improvements at all, or is it just the Well, same? even if we don't, I worked in lots of systems where the existing network was really inefficient and had lots of problems that we could fix without changing the ridership coverage split. And so sometimes you'll see redesigns we've done where we didn't change the ridership coverage split, but ridership got better overall. That's just because we found lots of design problems in the network that we could fix where there was just waste. I don't think there's much of that in your network. I think your network stretched pretty tight. So uh, now again, I haven't done a detailed analysis. You'll get that in the study that you're about to do deeper into that. But my first reaction is that I don't see a lot of waste. So 
what that means is that coverage service is going to be, but because the, because we by definition coverage service is spread out is a little resource spread over a big area, it's not going to be very frequent, and that's always going to limit its usefulness. So I would encourage you to think of sort of by definition we're talking about low ridership service when we talk about coverage service. You know, there's a different thing you do with much higher frequency when you're trying to generate range. Yeah, it's the connectivity I'm thinking of because yeah. I have a a neighborhood in my area that lost their service, they want it back. Um, and a lot of people that, I, I, rep, I, mean, I live in Amp House, okay. so we have SoCal Drive covered, but there's other parts of the area that has either infrequent or no service, but people want to be able to get to SoCal Drive where that is. So when you add coverage that's maybe infrequent, which is what I have now in my neighborhood, can you craft it so that it gets to these frequent areas within maybe not the 45 minutes, but approximately that? Do you see ridership? No. You're okay. still, it, it, it really is, is also, Supervisor Cody's question, it's you're still talking about a low frequency service into an area where density and or walkability are not really on our side. And as a result, you're just not going to be able to be useful to very many people. So, the, so the, the way the ridership coverage question plays out there is, if you turn the dial toward coverage, you get that feeder route. But you also, the so-called drive route stays every 30 minutes. Would you rather have the so-called drive route every 15 minutes and be something that's worth, for, worthwhile for people to walk to? Well, not everyone will walk to it. You know, some people in Aptos are like way down the hill from it. And, but that's what the ridership coverage trade-off is. Yeah. So that's, you know, if you don't have any money. Yeah, Mike. Uh, you've done a good job, I think, of teeing up a difficult discussion about um, coverage versus um, frequency. Um, I'm someone who's sort of schooled in the notion of giving two choices, what for the third? Um, <laughs> and my question would be, and it's not one that you can answer, but our staff would have to, work on this and perhaps other consultants or yourself later. The possibility of combining this difficult decision that we're going to have to make, it's easier for me. I, I'm appointed by the Board of Supervisors to be a citizen representative for the whole system and I don't have a narrow constituency like everybody else does to some extent, geographically speaking. Um, but my thought is, what about the possibility of combining a campaign to raise new funds for transit a transit tax, in effect, with this plan in such a way that, for example, you could at least not reduce the coverage uh, and then put the, the, you know, a vast majority of the new money into the frequency issue that you've basically been arguing in favor of in, in your presentation. Um, to what extent uh, might that avoid the other, you know, the kind of battles likely to happen about somebody who's thinking my constituency is, you know, about coverage. We're not on SoCal Avenue. In my experience, it's important in studies like the one you're about to begin to have the conversation about in the austerity context as well. Because if you want people to vote for more money, they need to see how far the current money goes. And they need to understand that the reason you're not serving them better is not that you don't like them. The reason you're not serving them better is that you're also doing these other things. And here's what you would have to in order to serve them better. You know? And so, in my experience, when people have that kind of experience of having to see what the real choices are, it makes them understand and, and make a more informed decision about whether they want to pay more to have more service in some form. Right? Because otherwise, a large part of the population will easily will say, and you mentioned this earlier, they're running these empty buses around. Obviously, it's not important. Important talking point about that, by the way, your staff is being very smart to run big empty buses around because operating cost is mostly late. You must constantly explain to your constituents who talk to you about empty buses that the marginal cost of that empty seat is very nearly zero. It would be much, much more expensive to run smaller buses, 
so as to carry, have fewer in empty seats, but also occasionally have overloads and passes. So it is absolutely important everyone to be able to explain this because that's a really common illusion that, oh, we see those empty buses, they must, they must be wasteful. No, they're not, they're very efficient. And actually, I don't know, I could be corrected, but I don't think our problem is that we actually are riding a bunch of empty buses. It tends to be things where there's service in one direction, like to the university campus, where the buses are staying in the morning and pass by in one direction, but coming back in the morning, people are not all going home. And there will always be places where people see buses empty, you know, near the end of the line or whatever. You just always have to be able to respond to that. So, um, a question, and I, I want to look to Bruce and Mike, who's been on this for a long time. One of my recollections is we've been sort of coverage oriented in order to assure that we have the paratransit coverage for a large area. So I love the map with the lines, but I almost imagine the gray area that illustrates the paratransit coverage by maintaining those outlying routes that may only come once an hour. So, so does that fit reality or am I misperceiving? Well, yeah, the previous conversation, yeah. Retreat from it's it was uh, about um, you know more uh, have have right uh, focus on ridership you know the denser areas and get the bigger bang for your buck you know that's what I heard well five years ago or whatever it was yeah uh, concentrate on that and get better ridership before you start expanding out and I I represent the San Lorenzo Valley which is relatively got good uh, uh, frequency up there but. I, I just one question I had aside from that is, does the you know, the, so, the, the new term now equity, does it does that come into play a lot or probably a lot more today than it would have five or ten years ago? Well, y'all gonna have to tell me what equity means. <laughs> yeah, it's, got it's not got a it's not got a, a an agreed definition. But one of the things that equity means is that we care about the the needs of disadvantaged and sometimes also historically excluded or marginalized populations. Okay, well in the context of the geometry, it still matters where those people are. It always matters where they are. And so let me tell you what we're doing in a project I'm doing right now for trying to import where I live. We've put out a draft plan based on having heard from the public we have two pillars, which are ridership and equity. Those are the only two justifications of service that we're supposed to be working with. So, what does that mean? That means that I'm going to we're going to design a, a network with lots of frequent service, which is a high ridership network, which, by the way, also serves lots and lots of disadvantaged people who are fortunate to live on it. Then we look at our coverage and we say, which of this coverage is serving significant disadvantaged populations, and we keep that coverage. But coverage of, say, a largely affluent, hard to serve valley up into the mountains with big, nice houses? No, that probably goes away. Because if there isn't, if, the, if it has neither a ridership justification nor an equity justification, it goes away. Obviously, people are screening all over the place. That's part of the process. And I don't know where that's going to end up. But that's the draft plan that we put out that based on what we were being told uh, about what the goal should be. So yeah, one of the ways you can manifest equity is to, and, and you heard that in Adam's survey too, did you hear that? Uh, when he asked specifically about focus, is it appropriate to be focusing on low income people? You've got like over 70%, yes. Now in practice, what that means, now I don't need that justification to justify good service on SoCal Drive, right? That's justified by ridership. I do need that justification to decide to run a particular circulator in Watsonville where the geography is not suited to high ridership, but where I know I have particularly intensive population in need. That becomes equity justified by ridership, right? I think that the answer to your yeah. question is, I think it's, that's more episodic. There's a couple small cases where we kept the line because there seemed to be quite a few uh, disabled folks that already access to paratransit. I don't think that's, it's been much more like people of Davenport need some service, right. you know, you can't leave them with nothing uh, since some of them go to Santa Cruz High or whatever that body did. Actually, so, actually, right. actually made some bus times around Bells at Santa Cruz High for the folks up there. But I also think that there's a, it's very hard, 
not to make things more complex, but it's always hard to have this discussion without uh, a planning discussion about where people can, low-income people and disabled people can afford to live. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say this is where we have high trans, you know, high frequency service. If you expect that kind of service, public service from us, subsidized by taxpayers' dollars, this is the place where you need to live. You can't, you know, live up in the middle of nowhere in the mountains and expect that we're going to run either paratransit or anything else up to you. We had somebody like that who was in Eagle Rock or someplace. You know, they literally was like an hour ride to get to their house or something to pick them up. And you know, at some point we said no. We had to. But I do think that we, in, in this, again, well, this is a different question than like getting more money. We really do need to think about, and this is an issue in my city, Santa Cruz, um, you know, we had a corridor plan trying to build a lot more affordable housing along Central Avenue, which got turned down at one point by the city council. I don't think that's the current council's view, but that decision was made. Uh, that makes it, it would be a much easier argument that people should be living along the bus route if they want to have a affordable housing or uh, accessible to disabled folks housing, don't expect us to come serve you out there in the middle of nowhere. You need to like find a house where we're running the transit service. Absolutely. It's great that we have elected officials here on the board who are part of both of those conversations because ultimately that has to be with one conversation. Well, and in Scotts Valley, we have one of, one of the issues we have is we have transit center right there and we built housing, uh, dense housing, with limited parking, mm -hmm. saying, you know, we, well, they can walk to the bus. However, then of course, and they had it in their CCNRs that there would just be two parking spaces per home. Of course, it wasn't long that they were calling us, they wanted 54 spots in the metro parking lot for their vehicles. And how dare us approve a project without more parking? And I said, you guys all knew. <laughs> and they said, well, yeah, but our kids grew up and this happened. And and we're, you know, so the idea, I've gotten to the point of going, I can't rely on the fact that they could walk because they're not. And then they're filling other areas with parking and we're really struggling to manage that. So it sounded logical, put dense housing near Metro and they can take the bus, but they're not. So I'm not sure, but I see your recommendation to do this. I'm going, it sounds good on paper, but it doesn't seem to be working in my neighborhood. I think that the thing that needs pushback in that conversation is, is as you said, and I understand that it was not pleasant or, or to, to push back. Still this, not. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, um, as you said, they knew what they were buying and they knew what this was. And I, I mean, look, you know, we know where state law is going on this now. And one of the reasons the state is getting actively involved in this is precisely because it is so horrible for you as a city official to deal with this by yourself, and now you can blame the state. Um, and, and that's great, you know, that's part of, that's part of, the, of, of the larger process of, you know, getting the kind of transition that we need, both for affordability and for climate. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. Just one thing, and I don't know where it's coming up, but when you're mentioning the bicycles and stuff, we have also a group of uh, employed group that has been calling Metro Courageous up at UCSD's uh, admin and enterprise building that want bikes, you know, and we and and there are not enough bike racks on the buses, you know, and and so that's another challenge that I'm not sure how to solve. Um. Bike racks on buses are one of those wonderful ideas that only work as long as they're not very popular. And, but they don't scale. They don't scale. What scales is, bike, is secure bike parking. Um, and, um, you know, I think you know that. But, yeah, that's true. I just wanted to build off of something that Mike was bringing up as far as where we provide service. We actually have an urban and rural services lines in the county to find today. So you live outside those lines, you're probably not going to get water service. You're definitely not going to get sewer service. I would argue, why should you get transit service? Uh, you know, I recently was training for the Sunrise Rotary Ride. Got 
gotten a chance to get out on a lot more uh, of our county's rural roads. Uh, there's been places that I was shocked to find a bus stop. <laughs> I mean, like some of the yeah. furthest, I, like Wheelock Road and Green Valley Road. <laughs> <laughs> I had never been on Wheelock Road in my life. Um, and uh, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm for dialing up the, the dial to 90. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that we could do a lot more, um, and I'm also interested in, in opportunities um, for funding that are related to, to land use too. I mean, how can we get, um, you know, in order to in order to get the housing we need, we're going to have to dial back parking requirements. I think that the geometry might just not be there in Scotts Valley yet. Um, I would venture to say that's why we've we've seen that with your project. Um, but I, I, you know, I think we've got to. It's going to take some time, but I think we need to keep pushing the geometry in the right direction. Uh, I just have to step out for like 20 minutes. But I want to encourage others, guests, and public, please, if you have questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Walker. I really admire your work and appreciate you bringing your expertise here. So thank you so much. Um, I have a few thoughts that came to mind. One is your statement about equity. I would say it's not just caring about um, including, including others from other communities, but actually, actually bringing in representatives that speak on behalf of the needs of those communities within our community. A um, couple thoughts about moving forward in terms of, we know that e-cars are not a viable move for the future because we don't even have the natural resources to fund or to um, provide all those cars that we need. So we have to somehow move towards public transit and that's moving forward. But I'm trying to think of in terms of um, the turnaround ability of buses, for example. And you spoke lightly about rail. I loved your comment about put liberating service where it will liberate the, mo the most people, where the most people will go. I feel that, of course, rail is a wonderful addition as a backbone to our community because it hits through the heart of so many of our towns and cities and that I um, absolutely agree that our busing needs to be ramped up demonstrably for our community. But I'm curious as to the longevity of uh, a particular bus over time in comparison to a EV car or a rail car, that sort of thing. And then um, I apologize, just one more uh, thought about ground up level uh, community involvement. So for example, I think Boulder, Colorado increased their ridership something like 200% at the same time that our ridership decreased somewhere around 25%. Um, just your thoughts on that ground of level of inclusivity that can excite the system. And thank you again so much. The second question first, it was great that Boulder had a community-driven process. The important thing is that that community-driven process led to Boulder spending lots of money on transit. Right. I mean, what they did effectively, and Boulder sits inside a larger transit agency, right? So it, was, it would be as if um, Palo Alto, say, which sits inside of VTA, had decided to massively fund its own transit system far above and beyond um, what the regional transit agents would do. That's what Boulder did. Um, I think, and you know, totally agreeing with you about the role of community representation, certainly in these kinds of studies, it's very common to spend a third a budget at least on public outreach, sometimes even half the budget on public outreach, because it's a lot of work to find the people who can speak, especially for marginalized communities. <clears throat> One of the things I encourage you to be aware of when you get into public meetings, and this is just this is this is not to invalidate everybody's input, everybody's input is valuable. But you will tend to hear from people who have time. You will tend to hear from people who have time to engage with you. And so if you want a transit network that's useful to people in a hurry, you have to price in the fact that you're not going to hear from them as much because they are too busy to engage. Even separate of, issues, of barriers of, of education and language and things like that, which we can work, which you, know, you can work with to some extent, effective communications in Spanish and so on. Um, you just keep have to visualizing, keep visualizing that single mother who has two jobs and then goes to get the, child, the, the kid from child care and has no tool. And so you won't hear from her. And so you have to be aware of her because she won't be here talking. 
Thank you so much for the presentation. <coughs> um, really insightful, and I'm excited to now get your book and read it. Um, in your work, have you engaged or have communities engaged with the bus drivers and gotten their input and feedback in terms of how their scope and their work has impacted in where that balance lands in terms of ridership or coverage? Well, when we talk about the ridership coverage trail, I'm pretty clear that that needs to be a conversation with the customers of the agency, by which I mean everybody who's writing you checks, which is the entire population. Mm -hmm. And that it's the role of staff to implement that direction, and I would include bus drivers as part of that larger staff, where because it's a value judgment um, about what the priorities are for public funding, I think it's an everyone question. When I'm doing projects like this, I'm talking to bus drivers because I need their knowledge of, and, uh, and I need to understand their experience. And I need to understand, you know, if, if they're having to go pee on a tree because their life, because their route is ending in a place where they don't have any facilities, I need to know if they are, um, if they have enough time. I need to know all, all those kinds of aspects of their experience. And so there's all kinds of great information that, that comes from there that's an, important, that's an important part of that process. And it's not like we don't value their opinions, it's just that like anyone else on staff, they're ultimately here to deliver what the public wants to pay for and, and according to the values that are motivating that investment. I want to, uh, one more question. I just have one more. Take a break. Go ahead. Um, with regards to what Manu said about the urban service line, I was going to bring that up because you can't really develop these large-scale um, housing uh, developments without having that line. And I know you don't have that on your map, but some of us have it in our heads a little bit. But the affordability um, comment that you made earlier about our county is because we're so unaffordable, a lot of people just literally carve out a place to live where they can, and it's not necessarily within that urban service line. They're literally renting a lean-to up in the mountains, and you know they're riding they're they're riding on all these little roads just to get to where the road road is. So it's just something I think we need to consider when we're figuring out what that equation is. Right. No, the, the, the suburbanization and ruralization of poverty to some extent driven by problems of affordability. We heard from the beginning, at the very beginning, about staff here driving in from Salinas or Hollister or wherever it was. That's what they did. I'll serve us along with you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's Uh, take a break until about 10 past 11. Give everybody a chance to get up, get a snack, do our things. Right. We, we talked about upcoming planning efforts at the agency. I just want to give you the timeline. In December, uh, actually in November, you'll have the recommendation on the preferred proposal to do your uh, short and your long range planning. And so we're hoping that in December you actually kick off those efforts. So for sure the first half of uh, calendar year 23, you'll be having great discussions uh, with your consulting team and with your staff and with, more importantly, the entire community about, you know, how you're building a better metro going into the future. So I'll, we'll leave that topic. And now, so the second session is all about zero emission bus technology. But before we have that discussion, we invite Steve Claremont up, and I think Wanda Moo's going to introduce Steve. Um, I certainly want to uh, bring Danielle up, and she's been working on a project the last six months that's pretty amazing. And uh, not only will I drive a, a, a bit of ridership on the system, but your goodwill throughout the system and your leadership uh, with the environment will come out in a big way through this project. And uh, I'm not sure she has it in her slides, but before she comes up, I just want to give you a list of people who are financially interested in this project, just to keep in mind while she's talking. 
you've got RTC, uh, Guy Preston and his staff, uh, who have the assets to help on this project that Danielle will talk about. You've got uh, Clever Devices as one of the, you know, the consulting team putting in your APC and putting in your uh, CAD ABL that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, to the tune of giving you a $100,000 discount on an upcoming contract just so they could participate in this project. And then we've got uh, Clean Energy, who provides your uh, natural gas. We've got Mark Thomas, your engineering firm. You've got Allied, uh, your uh, security. And then you've got Hanson and Bridget, all interested in being a partner on this project. So. Um, so we'll go with Danielle and her project, then uh, Wanda Moore will introduce Steve Claremont, and then Chuck's going to come up and put some spreadsheets on the screen uh, to show you how we're going to get to where we want to take it on the goal. So Danielle, all yours. Thank you. So I am Danielle Pagola, the Marketing Communications and Customer Service Director at Metro. Uh, as Michael mentioned, we have an exciting project that I'm going to introduce to you today. It's in our conceptual phase. Um, as you may know, Metro has a long-standing commitment to our community of clearing the air. So when we start to think about Metro's mission statement of protecting the environment, I thought to myself personally, what do I appreciate about this county? What makes us different from surrounding areas? And for me, that's seeing the dolphins at Manalisa Beach, or the whales from the harbor, or even just walking on our local coastline. Being in public transit allows us the ability to shape our local environment by reducing emissions. But to really make a lasting impact, we have to get the entire community involved. So we want to remind people that trading just one personal, personal vehicle use for a public transit ride, one ride at a time, makes a difference. And that's why we're working on the one ride at a time program with Metro. This campaign is aimed towards encouraging current Metro riders and potential riders to use public transit more often. Not only will the rider reduce emissions by using public transit, they will now have the option to donate directly to our local nonprofit partner, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And on this slide, we have some of uh, what the Monterey Bay Sanctuary does. And then I also have a little video for you here at the bottom here. If you want to go ahead. For nearly 30 years, our local community has overwhelmingly supported the protection of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. With 276 miles of spectacular coastline from Marin County to Cambria and over 6,000 square miles of ocean, this sanctuary is the largest in the continental United States. The sanctuary's Monterey Canyon, at more than two miles deep, is a seascape like no other. Called the Serengeti of the Sea, the sanctuary is home to countless marine mammals, shorebirds, and fish. Like the Grand Canyon and Yosemite National Park, it's a national treasure. The sanctuary is home to world-renowned science and research, and it's provided a clean and safe habitat for the marine animals that rely on our coastal waters to thrive and raise their young. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's Monterey Bay Chapter helps fund the ocean heroes who find and free entangled whales trapped in nets and debris, saving the lives of these majestic giants. And working in partnership with fishers and the community, we are supporting the design and testing of fishing gear to prevent these entanglements from happening. For the millions of people who live near or visit the Central Coast, the sanctuary offers wildlife viewing ocean recreation, stress reduction, and inspiration that can only be gained by escaping the pressures of daily life and experiencing the beauty of the natural world. Baynet and Team Ocean docents connect visitors both ashore and on the water to sanctuary wildlife, allowing people to safely explore and discover the wonders of the sanctuary. The community's involvement with the sanctuary is at the heart of its success. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, just like oceans around the world, today are being threatened by climate change, by human destruction, by political threats. That's why we need your support more than ever. So please go to MontereyBayFoundation.org and help us to protect this legacy for our children. Our planet 
needs your help. Do it now. Uh, so based on a customer loyalty approach, riders will now have the option to donate funds to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation via RTC's Go Santa Cruz program. We believe the added donation incentive will not only give our current riders, but our environmentally conscious community, community members the added incentive to ride Metro. As part of the campaign, for every 50 rides, $10 can be donated to this local nonprofit. This will be done through the current Go Santa Cruz program that encourages and incentivizes our community to use alternate transportation means over personal vehicles. Riders interested in the program can register online and start logging their trips immediately. Once in the program, riders can tra track their trip progress of the donation and view their emission savings by using Metro. After 50 rides, the riders will have the opportunity to de designate a donation to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And then just as one more part of this campaign, in order to really highlight the importance of what we're trying to do here for our local community, we would like to go ahead and wrap 25 to 30 of our buses with the one time, uh, one ride at a time messaging. And this would include mess uh, imagery directly from the Monterey Bay, thanks to photographers, to photographers like Jody Freeman and National Geographic photographer Franz Lansing. So I have a couple examples for you. It's really just to drive the point home that we're trying to stay in uh, our local environment, reduce emissions, and everything that comes from that. And really just writing one or two trips of public transportation a week or even a month actually really makes a difference. And so we will be coming to you guys in the next 60 to 90 days with a more formal plan and announcing more program partners. Uh, but as Michael mentioned, we already have a lot of agencies and individuals involved. Um, so we're hoping this is a very successful project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is Wendy Moore. Um, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Steve Cremont, uh, our senior consultant from uh, uh, CTE, Center for uh, transportation and environment. Uh, Steve has uh, more than 25 years of experience in um, sustain sustainability development and alternative uh, transportation technology. Uh, Steve uh, holds master's, master's of Business Administration degree and Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Management from Georgia Tech. City has been working with uh, almost more than 100 transit agencies nationwide uh, in terms of uh, transition to zero emission. City and the Metro has been working uh, on zero emission technology over the last five, uh, five years. City helped us to apply for grants for FTA grant in FY16 uh, for the highway, uh, highway zero emission uh, buses. Uh, Steve gonna give us some presentation on uh, Zero emission bus technologies, and uh, 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 thank you. Thank you, on the moon. Uh, do I need to switch anything over here? Click it. <coughs> All right, very good. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. My name is Steve Claremont. Um, really quick introduction about CT, the Center for Transportation and Environment. We are a nonprofit planning and engineering firm, which is kind of an odd combination when you think about it. Um, but we are engineers first, and our entire mission is to help move zero emission transportation and the adoption of zero emission transportation and uh, uh, technologies into the market. Um, we do that through research, development, demonstration programs, and deployment programs, um, and typically in combination with federal government or state government funding, fleets like yourselves, and technology providers. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides here. Just real quick, as one of you mentioned, um, we've had a lot of success over the last uh, 15 years or so in working with transit agencies on zero emission technologies. Um, one thing about transit is because the fed they have federal access to federal funding, it's an easy place to get the technology into the market. Um, professional operators, professional maintenance, 
allows us, and the fixed routes allows us to collect data and analyze the performance of this new technology. And then that technology starts getting out into the general market. And we're seeing that today with uh, battery electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles starting out in transit and getting into the broader sector of, the, of commercial trucking. Um, we've wor been working with Metro for quite some time now. Um, started in about 2016 with a, a grant application that we helped we work with uh, Metro to write and was awarded for battery electric buses. Shortly after the award, I made a trip out here, drove over Route 17 where the buses are supposed to be deployed, and I thought, oh my God, what did we just commit ourselves to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why we, that's a, such a challenge. Um, first of all, the CARB's ICT regulation, the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation, which you are subject to, just to understand what that regulation is all about. Um, first of all, you know, we've heard about the, the 2040 goal, to be 100% zero emission. That's a goal, that's not the regulation, right? That's a goal. The regulation is a pur purchasing requirement. So for small fleets like yourselves, by 2026, um, all new buses that you order start or procure in that year, 26 per, I'm sorry, 25% of those buses need to be zero emission. Doesn't need to be your, doesn't mean your entire fleet is zero emission. All right, so if you were to um, buy 20 buses in this year, okay, a quarter of those or five of those buses would have to be zero emission. That's what that means. So that number, the number of uh, percentage of new bus procurements um, for zero emission would, will increase over time up to 2029 when going forward all new buses that purchase, you purchase have to be zero emission. So um, and that gets you to zero emission by 2040 assuming that you hold your buses for 12 years. So that's the uh, FTA standard that you have to hold your buses for a minimum of 12 years. So you hold them for only 12 years, by 2040 you'll be at 100%. Um, but most agencies, like yourself, hold on to your buses a little bit longer than that. Um, but assuming that it's a 12-year program, that's what you get to. Um, so let's little, talk a little bit about uh, the technology itself and what is a zero emission bus. Um, I think we all know why zero emission is important uh, and what the advantages of zero emission are. So we get right into the technology itself. Essentially, a hydrogen fuel cell bus and a battery electric bus are very much the same, all right? They both have an electric drive system which basically propels the vehicle forward, okay? They both have batteries. Just the battery electric bus has a lot more batteries, right? That's the batteries that supply power to the electric drive, batteries supply power to the electric drive that moves the bus down. The big difference is with a battery electric vehicle, much like a, a Tesla or a battery electric bus, much like a Tesla, there's an external charger that will charge that battery and you go out and run the vehicle and take energy from the, the battery. In the fuel cell bus, you have hydrogen tanks on there. So you're fueling hydrogen, um, the hydrogen moves through the fuel cell, supplies electricity to the battery, and the battery drives the electric drive. So again, virtually the same type of technology, but think about this as having an onboard charger and this is an offboard charger. Um, some of the key things to understand, though, about um, either one of these technologies is there no free heat. So on a, on a CNG bus or a diesel bus, uh, those, those, those systems, like a diesel bus, only about 25% of the fuel you burn in a diesel bus actually is used to move that bus down the, down the road. The rest of it's all used to generate heat, right? So the primary purpose of an engine is to generate heat and the byproduct is really to move the vehicle down the street. You know, since you don't have an engine any longer, you no longer have that free heat. So that has to come with an, ex an external heating system. So now there'll be a radiant heating system that gets added to this, or an HVAC system. 
So if you want to use heat, the only source of power for that, that heat is coming from the same batteries that are moving you down the road. So you can either decide to move the, batter, the bus down the road or heat the bus, uh, but if you're heating the bus, you're not getting the range. So there's an impact in the range required. Um, the other big differences between these is the time to refuel these vehicles. So a battery electric bus can take three to four hours to recharge. All right, it's a fairly slow process. A fuel cell bus is about the same time as a CNG bus or a diesel bus. So operationally, a fuel cell bus matches kind of what you're doing today. Think about kind of the processes you go through when, you, when a bus goes back in the yard, goes through and gets clean, gets fueled, and is parked, and you take it out the next day. Battery electric bus is a slightly different process. It has to get clean if it goes parked and gets charged, and hopefully it's charged by the time you want to leave and want to move on. Uh, efficiency comparison. And this is also very important. So a CNG bus is probably the least efficient of all the fuel types that are out there. It's getting on average about three to four miles per diesel gallon equivalent. A diesel bus gets about four miles per gallon. Hybrids are a slight improvement over that. Um, light duty hybrids are a lot more efficient than heavy duty hybrids, so that's a marginal improvement um, with a bus. Um, fuel cell, as you can see, is a, you know, significantly better. And battery electric is far better than any, any other type of technology. One thing to point out, though, is, is this range or differences between the um, efficiency. So, whereas all these other types of technology, the efficiency range can be within the, you know, fairly small range. With a battery electric bus, some days you're going to get over 20 diesel mile a gallon equivalents. Some days you're only going to get around 12. So, this makes it operationally a little bit more difficult, it requires a little bit more planning. You don't know which day you're going to get which. Okay, so there's a lot of factors involved with that. Um, another thing to compare technologies: on your standard diesel uh, bus, you have about 100 gallons of fuel on it. That 100 gallons of fuel gets you about 400 miles at that four miles per gallon. With a battery electric bus, which carries 450 kilowatt hours of battery. <coughs> That battery has about 12 diesel gallon equivalents, all right? So you would never leave the yard with only 12 gallons of diesel fuel on it, right? You, you always want to fill it up and then go out on the route. However, because of the efficiency of, a vehicle, of battery electrics, it's about four times as efficient as a diesel vehicle. Remember I said before, the diesel engine is only about 25% efficient, and 25% of the fuel you burn actually goes to moving that bus down the road. So an electric motor is about four times as efficient, so that 12 diesel gallons whoops, sorry, acts, um, allows you to get about 200 miles, acts about, about a, like a 50 diesel gallon equivalent, and gets you about 200 miles of, of range as a result. All right. Still, it's not at the 400 mile range. So what are the factors that affect uh, range? And as I go through this, think about this in context of the operation here for Metro. Um, speeds, stop, grades, so highway speeds require more uh, energy. So if you have stop and go traffic with your general braking, you actually are more efficient than you are when you're driving on the highway. Um, ridership, so it's all about moving weight so the heavier the bus is, the more passengers there are, the heavier the bus becomes, and you lose efficiency as a result. Climate, right, heating and cooling, I already talked about that. The battery, you have to use the battery to heat the bus, you have to use the battery to cool the bus, so that reduces your range. Um, degradation, um, we're all familiar with, you know, your, your cell phone is awesome when you first get it, it lasts for days, and it seems like after about a year, yeah, maybe you get a day or less out of it, and then after that, it's useless, right? Same thing with battery electric buses or batteries that are on the bus. All right, they, they suffer degradation. 
and at a certain point in time, they have to be um, replaced or refurbished. Um, so you'll, you lose range. And then finally, the operator themselves. You can't operate one of these vehicles the same way you operate a diesel bus. All right? the, the, you know, slamming on all accelerator or all brake, it leads to great inefficiency. The operator can make about a 30% difference in efficiency. So training on operation of these buses are very important. Um, so we have a we have a methodology trying to understand all these factors and how it impacts your service, how these vehicles can be used in your service, and ultimately how what your the impact is on capital and operating expenses. We took Metro through this process um, uh, recently. So let's talk about some of the results of that process. So first we go through. Um, vehicle modeling. So we collected data on a bunch of your routes. We have uh, a software system that was developed by Archon National Labs where we can simulate the operation of a battery electric bus on your routes based on the data we collected. So right now, we, when we talk about feasibility, when you're setting a bus out on your route um, in your blocks, can we uh, meet the same performance criteria as your current buses? And right now, maybe based on current technology, about 40% of your blocks can be feasibly operated with a battery electric bus, an overnight charge battery electric bus. Now we do expect technology to improve over time, and actually technology has improved since we did that. Uh, it's been probably two years since we've done that. But with improvement in technology, either energy density of batteries or more efficiency in components, we do expect that you'll be, by 2040, that you'll be up around 85% or so um, for, for uh, feasibility, block feasibility. But that's not 100%. Uh, that's not 100%, that's not 100%. So what do we do to improve your, the ability to reach that 100%? So we look at a couple different scenarios. Again, the scenario we just looked at was depot charge or overnight charge, battery electric buses at the depot. So that would be the only opportunity to refuel. And as a result, we see that we can only replace about 62% of the fleet by 2040 if we limit ourselves to that technology. So we have to look at alternatives to improve that feasibility. So on route charging, that's an option. You may have seen some of that uh, before where buses will op <coughs> excuse me, operate and then say at a transit center, receive additional charge and then continue to operate throughout the day. So that's, that is a, 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 an option for you. There are some challenges with that, operational challenges. Essentially, um, once you get behind schedule, you can't make it up because you always have to charge and you'll be behind, be behind schedule for the rest of the day. So you have to account for that recharge time at the depot. Um, we can also use um, a mixed fleet, a battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell. So where battery electric buses are kind of designated to the easier, shorter blocks, less strenuous blocks, hydrogen fuel cell are put on the, the longer blocks, the more strenuous blocks. Or finally, if you decide, well, if I'm gonna mix my fleet, why don't we just stick with one technology and just go with all hydrogen? So of course, so 100% is achievable, but just not with that single technology. Um, infrastructure. So in addition to the buses, you need to consider a whole new set of fueling infrastructure. And this is a conceptual slide to think about here on the, the relative cost of infrastructure for, for battery electric versus hydrogen. So it also leads to understand, you know, why you don't see too many hydrogen buses out there in the market right now. Everything's all about battery electric. Because with battery electric right now, you can go out and buy a single battery electric bus and a charger fairly cheaply and get that charger installed and be off and running. So the, the cost of entry at, at a very small fleet size or for very few buses is pretty low. A hydrogen fuel fueling station, you know, at, at a minimum is going to be $5 million, all right? Um, 
And to spend that much money to fuel just a few buses on a pilot project, you're not going to do that. Very few agencies do that. So that's why the, the cost per bus uh, for a small fleet size is very high. But over time, uh, on the fuel cell side, you get able to leverage that cost over more buses, so the cost per bus get, becomes much lower. All right. Whereas a battery electric bus, it's not just about a single charger per bus. Then you have to start adding more transformers and more infrastructure to support all those additional chargers, and it, the costs actually start escalating over time. Um, looking at infrastructure, if you were to go battery electric at your facility, we'd be looking at some sort of overhead structure in order to, they're very space constrained. So in addition to like, uh, you know, the challenges, the route challenges that you have with the, the high speeds and the hills, you're also very space constrained with your facility. So you're gonna have to build up and that adds cost um, to do some sort of overhead infrastructure for your equipment. Um, if you were to go down that path, this is kind of a conceptual view of, of all these different gantry structures and how that might look. But all that equipment takes up space, space that you don't have currently. So if you were to go down that, this path, I think you can park, what, seven or 10 fewer buses in your yard uh, if you were to go down this way. All right. On the hydrogen side, again, this, this is kind of a conceptual view of some of the equipment that you might need. Um, if you're placing it on your property, we're, we're envisioning that, that back corner that would be the place that you would put that because you can't get rid of your CNG fuel <coughs> equipment. You need to keep that as long as you have CNG around. Um, that's kind of a picture of a real life system about the size that you would require. So as we think about your transition and your plan, one of the things that we need to consider, as I mentioned, you're going to, you still need to maintain all your fueling equipment um, throughout the transition period. So probably for the next you know, 20 years, that equipment needs to be maintained. Um, we talked about JKS, and it's, uh, so, you know, I, I showed you the constraints, the parking constraints of either. If you're trying to do both fuels at the same facility, that makes both, both problems even worse. Um, we talked about refueling time already. Um, transition risks, so some other things to consider um, as you're going through your planning or implementation. So supply chain issues, we've all, all heard the phrase and probably have experienced that, but right now, most uh, battery electric projects are looking at two to three years um, from inception. So not only is it the buses are impacted, but the utilities are, are severely impacted as well. So I was with a client uh, a couple weeks ago and their utility uh, was saying it was 18 months for a transformer. Mm. So now it's, you know, it's the utility that's driving some of the timeline to get some of these things implemented. Um, of course, with battery electric, you're subject to the grid. And of course, when you have rolling blackouts or when you're saying you have your state government say, suggesting that you shouldn't charge your battery electric vehicles uh, for a period of time because of the constraints on the grid. Um, this is a challenge for you, all right? So there's, when this means you need to invest in other technology and more equipment to mitigate the risk of blackouts, all right? On the hydrogen side, um, again, uh, there's a desire for green hydrogen, so you know, hydrogen made from um, um, biogas uh, sources, um, which is great, okay? It's a little bit more expensive, but you won't be the only ones that want this fuel. Right now, the produ you know, production capacity of green hydrogen is very low. It is increasing, but guess what? Everybody else wants it as well. So while there's a desire to um, get a much lower cost of hydrogen, and I really didn't mention the cost of hydrogen being extraordinarily high, um, right now uh, for you know, non-green hydrogen sources, it's about $8 per kilogram. 
Um, it really needs to be less than five in order to be more compatible with diesel or CNG. Um, I don't see that price getting any lower and it might get more expensive as the demand for hydrogen increases. Um, technology maturity, there, there are more battery electric vehicles and service out there and part of that is because of the ease of implementation. Uh, so there are a lot more options available for all sorts of size vehicles as well as manufacturers. Fuel cell vehicles, uh, fuel cell buses, um, there's only 40 footers and 60 footers made. Um, you know, it's going to take a while before other options are available. There's only two manufacturers out there right now. Um, so that's a challenge you need to consider as well. Uh, operational constraints, we talked about range. Um, fuel cell, um, you know, it's not the answer to everything. Right now we're start seeing some performance issues um, on high speed routes and hilly routes. And you have a few of those around here. So that's something we, we need to consider. Now, that problem will get solved with time and technology improvement, but based on the current technology out there, there are some limitations to where we would recommend using a fuel cell vehicle. Finally, emergency response and incident. I mean, we're so focused on the zero emission side and moving that down the equation. This is, don't forget to consider incident response. Okay, with a battery electric bus, um, if there's a thermal event in the unlikely event of a thermal event, you're not going to put that bus out. You're going to let it burn to the ground, essentially what happens. Um, now fortunately there's plenty of safety systems on, um, on these buses so that if it's in operation and there are passengers on it, there's going to be bells and warnings on any impending thermal event just so that it doesn't like just go up instantly. So there's plenty of time to get passengers off and call for emergency service, so that's not a safety issue. The issue that we see is if that bus is parked in your yard and you notice, you know, go back, think about the picture of that, all the buses parked in your yard. And there's a bus in the middle, there's a thermal event, well, the, the bus is turned off. There's no sensors that are running on that bus. So no one's going to know that, that, that there's a pending thermal event on that bus. And your, your first indicator of it will be the smoke coming out of the top of it. So, again, what is what is going to be done? This is a really serious issue because yeah. this happened recently, yeah. uh, and so it's top of mind for a lot of folks in the industry right now. Is how do we address that? And there are basically the only way you address that is pour tons and tons and tons and tons of water on it and keep pouring it until the thing smolders to the ground. All right. Um, a thermal, you know, uh, uh, fuel cell bus also has batteries on it. Um, not as many, all right, so that helps. Um, it does have hydrogen, um, but it, it's not a Hindenburg event that, uh, <laughs> you know, hydrogen escapes and evaporates and goes into the air very quickly. So the Hindenburg, uh, it wasn't hydrogen that was burning in the Hindenburg, it was the, the shell of the itself. So that's uh, just something to think about. But again, some, some serious considerations here to build into your designs. So with <clears throat> thinking about operations, thinking about range constraints, thinking about yard constraints, thinking about your topography and your climate, you know, working with the Metro team, we came up with, with a recommendation. So number one, zero emission bus with, is the priority. Um, we consider a mixed fleet scenario, but the, the focus should be on hydrogen buses. We'd be, we think that that's going to be a better solution for you in the long run. Um, the near-term purchasing goal, uh, a, again, a preference for ZEBS, but any time you go out to purchase or each year you're going to purchase, we suggest doing some modeling and analysis to make sure that what you want to purchase is feasible. With first, a hydrogen bus, is it not feasible with a hydrogen bus? Is it feasible, feasible for a battery electric? And in the unlikely event it's not feasible with either of those technologies, 
still allow for a renewable natural gas bus in the near term um, because it's more incumbent that you provide service um, and ensure that you can provide service versus just focusing entirely on zero emission. Long-term purchasing goal, obviously it's following the ICT procurement schedule. Again, I don't anticipate that you would have an issue with that. Um, and again, the next thing is is really um, doing a, a, a authorities having jurisdiction. It's really a permitting study. So, you know, you're you're in some sensitive areas right now with putting that equipment. Again, we just want to make sure you wouldn't have any permitting hurdles uh, with coastal commission, or with fire department, or with the city, with putting hydrogen stations in the location that we had, had recommended. All right. Any questions? Oops. I think what we might do is go into Chuck's piece yeah. and then group them all together because you're this is a perfect intro to Chuck's spreadsheets. Sure. Okay, Chuck. You no, know I love spreadsheets. <laughs> Sorry. It's not that bad. <laughs> Chuck's model. Oh, he's got it down. Yep. Well, just so you can see, I, I'm just going to let you know, I'm not going to talk specifically in detail about numbers, so I promise I won't get you guys all squirreled up in numbers and details, but I want to talk about this because it is pretty important. So I'm going to talk quickly about zero emission bus plan. Um, let me go this. I guess that's not the way to go. So... In the bus plan that, that, that I'm going to talk about, um, basically we've gone through a three-phased approach. So just to kind of get a little bit clear, we've been doing this for six months. Six months we've been talking about this, talking about how do we transition Metro from diesel and CNG to zero emission buses? I know we have to get there, but how do we do it? And as part of that process, Michael, Juan, Manu, John, I mean, everybody's kind of been part of this process. And as part of it, one of the things is phase one, we deployed these Zs down in the Watsonville circular. So of course, these are the battery electric um, Proterra buses that are running down there. And it's just a start, so you know, check off on that. The second is, how do we convert the fleet in Watsonville to 100% um, you know, zero emissions, and that's one. And currently right now is, you know, it's the, uh, uh, basically the battery electric buses, and then we talk about hydrogen, which Steve alluded to earlier. And then third, and this is what uh, Michael talked about uh, at the beginning, is the fact fully transition the full agency. That means no more CNG, no more um, diesel powered buses on our lot. We're now primarily either fuel cell or battery electric buses here. And our goal is 2037. So right now, uh, as we kind of went through this process over the last six months, you know, we want to say, how do we get to zero uh, emission buses? And we went through basically three scenarios. One, let's just stuff ourselves with a whole bunch of CNG buses right now, wait till the, the three years where we talk about, well, 25% of our buses have to be zero emissions, the rest of them are, um, they could be either diesel or CNG, and just kind of wait and let the, the regulations take over, or do we gradually, from now, start to weed into buying buses that are zero emissions, and then, of course, once we get mandated in 2029, from there on out, it's all. Or do we just say, the heck with this. Let's just go Z and that. You know, why do we need to buy any more CNG buses or any um, diesel-powered buses, and how does that work? And then, as a result, and I will give you this, this is a different conversation that we had four or five months ago than we are having today. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But... Right now, we're going through all the financials to replace all 96 buses. We have 93 plus three released, released right now. So 96, 
we're going to spend between 130 to 140 million dollars to replace all these buses. Now, the biggest thing about it is a lot of this stuff comes from rebates and grants and so forth of that nature, external to the money that we receive. We put aside $3 million every year for our bus replacement fund. That's really our money. The rest of it is all coming from external sources, whether it's state, local, or the feds. And as part of it, it's actually $1.9 million cheaper for us to actually go Z now than it is to like buy a whole bunch of CNG buses and then wait for the mandates to kick in. And I'll walk you kind of through our process. So let's just focus right here on the top. The cost of a 40-foot electric bus is approximately $1.2 million. A hydrogen bus is $1.35 million. A CNG bus, this is why I said four months ago we could have had another conversation, it was less than $700,000. It's now $830,000. It's that supply chain. Everything's getting more expensive. But here's the kicker. In the electric and hydrogen, we get certain, um, I'll say, grants and rebates that come back that's only specific to uh, electric and hydrogen. And by taking in this money, we've now reduced the money to be eight hundred thirty for CNG, 833000 for a hydrogen and about 900000 for electric. See, now we're talking apples to apples because now we have buses that are basically on the same par and cost. And as part of it, even with the Arctic buses down here, $1.6 million for a hydrogen bus versus a $1 million for a CNG, when you start layering in the federal rebate, the state rebates, and so forth, that we'll get only with hydrogen and electric, we're talking about it's pretty much a million versus a million seventy versus a million one. So when you start talking about that, then all of a sudden it kind of like I said levels the playing field. This is something we want to look at. Now we have this conversation. Four months ago I couldn't have it because CNG up here was under seven hundred thousand dollars, and then we start creating a gap. But that gap is not closed. So. Based off of that, we looked at the alternative going zero base budget, or zero, zero, um, zero emissions bus, buses going forward. And as part of that process, we've kind of laid out a, a, a two-piece two approach to replacing our buses. So one is, we have historically bought buses either in lump sum, and then when a bunch of years not buying buses and then doing it again. As part of it, as you can see, Buses start coming in here where we're talking about beyond useful life. That just means beyond 14 years. It doesn't mean that we can't do some refurbishing to keep them running, but what it means is if we have these peaks that are going to come in. And then we went a bunch of years, no buses. And that's basically what happens. And then they come back again. Our buying habits should be more streamlined. We should be buying six to seven buses every year, assuming the service stays the same, 96 buses, which you know, that's another conversation about increasing service and increasing buses. But if we keep the six to seven buses, our bus replacement uh, plan, where we're putting aside $3 million a year, that covers half our buses. And if we get a grant, we could afford six or seven buses every single year as we go forward. And as part of it, we're talking about hydrogen up here. We have five electric in the works. We're talking about um, you know, uh, five Arctics that we need to get uh, you know, here as, as soon as possible. And that's really a conversation around, we're probably gonna go CNG, but we're looking heavily at whether it's gonna be electric or hydrogen and whether they can really fulfill the needs that we have up here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, one is around timing of when we can get them. And two, whether it has the ability to service it. But we know we are in need of those buses. So that may be something that we go with CNG, but that would be it. Outside of that, it's all fully 100% uh, um, zero, uh, uh, zero emission vehicles. And as you can see at the bottom, we have 24. Once you kind of do this replacement in and out, we actually get by 2032. Actually, I'll tell you that. By FY 3031, we've killed out all our backlog of old buses and we replaced all those old buses with basically zero base or zero um, emission buses. 
And then lastly, this is the eye track. I don't want to go into detail about it, but yeah, you kind of step out. So it, it's not about the dollars, it's about that we've solved the dollars up through 2036. It actually just goes even beyond here. But effectively, if you look down in the corner, that's the 96 buses to replace. In here, here's basically all the, this represents all the different sources of funds that we can use between now and going forward to pay for all these buses. And, you know, these are already uh, agreed to here. Uh, this is for the five electric buses. The CNG Arctic right now, it's only available for the uh, 5339A and the 5307. And then from here on out, it's hydrogen or hydrogen or electric. You know, it just depends on how the technology, so this will be evolving over time. But ultimately, this is our money right here. So 31 million out of that 140 is our money, and this is all coming from our bus replacement fund, that $3 million we're setting aside. So everything else, state rebates, 5339, MBARD, STIP, HVIP, all, I mean, all this stuff, these are all either rebates or money we're getting back from. So we have a pathway, and this is what we've been working on, and we feel like this is the pathway we need to start down. And like I said, we have contingency plans where we can, you know, separate one side, you know, move off the highway and go around the accident if need be. And as Steve alluded to, if we find that some of the supply lines in here of getting stuff ends up being three or four years, we can revert back and take another path if we need to in order to get it because I know we need buses and you know buses for ridership. But at least we have a path and now we have a, a direction going forward. And I think this is critical now and we have a financial way of getting there without touching our operating PL to create any type of problems. So can you or a consultant give us an idea of what percentage of our routes Given current technology, you can't be run with a hydrogen bus because of you know, the hills or whatever that is. Ballpark. Um, yeah, we, we haven't studied that, but my guess would probably be around 20% uh, that can't be done with um, hydrogen. Again, we need to spend a little bit more time um, to really understand if, if you're going to have those challenges here, but these are the challenges that we've seen elsewhere. Another question, um, I should know this, but don't. In terms of um, battery electric charging, are we currently charging our Watsonville circulators in Watsonville, or are they being charged in our main yard and then driven to Watsonville? What's the thought in terms of the, what thought of any we had about the question of where the charging stations would be for our system, given the constraints on our yard at the uh, yeah, current, currently, they're being charged at JKS, at your current yard. The thought is that um, if you were to build a facility in, in Watsonville um, and put electric charging down there, that feasibility would increase because a lot of the easier routes are, are down in that area. And um, the, the big challenge is you're, you're just deadheading from here to there, and that's what, what's requiring a lot of energy and pushing you over that feasibility threshold. So that is something that we did contemplate. We think we can increase feasibility if we did an all electric uh, facility in that location. So if you were, were to do a mixed fleet, I would still recommend you know that one location would be hydrogen, the other location would be electric. Okay. So, okay. so um, where's the infrastructure and the real estate money coming from? Like so this is all just for vehicles. Yes, this is just vehicles. So um, you know, I can't talk to you about a South County because that's still kind of in the works whether we do it or not. But as for the infrastructure, regardless of what scenario we got to put in the infrastructure, which includes chargers, whether it's overhead or under, and then as well as a hydrogen fueling station, and then there's some stuff we have to do with our maintenance facility. So is there funding for that as well? Or so as part of that, our goal is to go with the new uh, low note grant to go out and pay for that infrastructure piece, which is not on here because this, this is just focused on the bus part of it. Um, Michael, <coughs> sorry. Michael, uh, Mike, uh, 
Did you consider Highway 17 as that part of the 20 20 percent? Yes. Yeah. Because I thought there was a challenge with Highway 17. There's a challenge with Battery Electric on Highway. Uh, I mean, Battery Electric bus can do it. It was demonstrated. The challenge there was, can it do it as long as, you know, can it run an entire day? That's really the challenge there. So you, you would have to have multiple buses, to, uh, battery electric buses. Now, whether or not a fuel cell bus can adequately run that route, we haven't done the modeling, but I suspect there will be a challenge because you have highway speeds and... And so the current, tech, current um, fuel cell technology out there may not be able to keep up with it. Again, it could run, it may not be able to maintain the highway speeds. They okay? would be able to run it. Um, I do anticipate that that is a techni technical challenge that will be resolved um, before, far before 2040 or even 2030. Yeah, I, I want to emphasize this. You know, we're talking about technology today with the delivery schedule over the next 14 years. So technology here is going to be completely much better, much stronger than it is here. So a lot of the stuff as we start to deliver this could be around the easy routes, you know, Watsonville here, Santa Cruz. And as technology starts to expand, you know, and as we start swapping out our CNG buses, that's where I think Highway 17 and those kind of more steeper routes, hopefully then will be addressed and are fixed at that point. And is one better, oh, right, anticipated whether hydrogen or electric would be, or battery would be more effective on Highway 17 as far as the hills and the weight and all of those things? Yeah, I mean, assuming they get over uh, past the uh, propulsion challenges, um, certainly the a hydrogen bus carries more energy on it, so it would allow you to run the entire day. Whereas, you know, we've seen battery electric bus adequately demonstrated on that route, it just doesn't have enough energy to run the entire day, and so it would need a recharge, or you need a second bus to, to go out when, it, when that bus Simpson. runs out of energy. Thank you. As we rapidly move towards electric and or hydrogen uh, fuel, uh, sorry, energy, do we have a plan to oversee that we're using renewable resources for that energy? So, for example, with hydrogen, you can have pink, gray, green, yellow, blue sources. Green, of course, is really the only sustainably sourced uh, form of hydrogen. One of the things you said, actually, I'm sorry, the other gentleman who spoke first said, which is really uh, thoughtful, uh, could we then create our own green hydrogen that it becomes an income source? for our, not just bus metro, but greater uses within our community for transit. So I think right now you're um, purchasing renewable natural gas to run your CNG buses on. So certainly in the future with hydrogen, you can source um, renewable hydrogen um, from your suppliers. Um, you'll just pay more for it than fossil fuel based hydrogen. Um, your second question comes down to, you know, self-generation of that type of fuel. And we often get in these conversations whether or not we're talking about battery electric and producing your own electricity or hydrogen and producing your own hydrogen. But um, I think in the long run, um, economically, you're going to be better off buying it from an industrial supplier of that fuel. I mean, today you're not out there fracking nat natural gas or drilling for oil to produce your own diesel or, or, or natural gas to run your vehicle. So, and the reason is it's more economical to buy it from a, uh, a, a supplier, industrial scale supp supplier. The only reason why some agencies are considering producing it their own is that the supply of that energy, uh, hydrogen is not widely available or on the electricity side, um, the reliability is of a, a question or concern. So that's why agencies are considering producing it themselves. But in the long run, I don't believe that's gonna be the right equation. I think you're gonna be better off going with a, an external third-party supplier for that. So a statement and a question. I've 
I have been interested in hydrogen for some time because of its resiliency. Um, we, where we are, are dependent on PG&E for our power grid, and I believe the Metro JKS was impacted by some of the public safety power shutdowns. So that is a difficult way to run a transit system, especially if you have occasion to, say, use transit to move people away from a fire site or a, an area that's being evacuated. That was the statement. The second, the question is, is the scale of hydrogen fueling such that Metro might have a station that is shared with other jurisdictions or agencies? The city of Santa Cruz has a yard just down the street. Uh, are there other ways that there are partnerships with other jurisdictions? Is that a model? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it, I, it really depends on your funding source. Mm -hmm. All right, so if FTA is contributing to that, um, then you're limited to who can use it, Got it. unfortunately. Um, so if you're using non-federal sources, then you do have that opportunity to share. So for example, AC Transit's been running hydrogen buses for over a dozen years now, what, 15 years. So their particular station, they have a, a fence dividing it. On one side of the fence, it's all transit agency, the, the transit, they're fueling the transit buses on the other side of the fence. They actually have a public hydrogen fueling station uh, open to the public. So certainly there's a, a much greater opportunity for you to get into that sharing um, opportunity for, for hydrogen than there is for battery electric. I would say battery electric chargers, you never want to share those. Uh, if you need to, because you're going to spend three or four hours at that charger, you don't want somebody else sitting there. You don't want somebody's Tesla taking up your time and space on that, on that charger. Sorry. Thank you. Um, what about uh, AMBAG with San, San Benito Valley? Are Tell you what, we, we've talked about it. Yeah, we've talked about it. we've talked about you know San Luis Obispo, Monterey County, even us. Like, what if we put one in the Central Valley mm -hmm. or something like that to, to produce it and stuff like this? We just haven't progressed far enough to have those conversations. But it would be good if we can get kind of you know that the, the valley along with maybe even pulling in part of BTA because mm -hmm. BTA is going to have to go too. That we could all kind of leverage. I just you know, figured we're already in that organization. So it might make yeah. sense to start there. Yeah. And you may have noticed or not, but uh, MBARD, the Air District, was one of the fund sources on, on Chuck's yeah, list. Yeah. Um, I think in the interest of food, we might just, <laughs> any last statements? <laughs> and we can keep talking during I just want to say, Bruce, we need yeah. two to three, one to 200000 per bus, which is not reflected here, and it would actually be even more cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So from a staff perspective, I think the, the takeaways are that the, the climate's changing to where from just a pure bus perspective and buying a bus, it's just as, as uh, economical, if not more economical, to go a ZEB route, a zero emission bus route, than a traditional diesel or a CNG bus. So that has piqued the interest of staff to make sure when we go buy a bus, that it doesn't have a tailpipe on it unless the route, uh, unless the uh, technical specs on the bus don't meet what we need on the route. And I, I just think uh, when you're looking at that spreadsheet, 3C Energy is the, the asterisk at the bottom. Uh, their staff is in fluid conversation with us, and Chuck mentioned 200,000, and Bruce. Uh, their staff is, is looking at $200,000 contributions to Metro towards future ZEP purchases. So you can see how even further that will create a ZEP price that is, is to our advantage. So I guess the bottom line takeaway, at least from my perspective, is that's uh, it's just the technology now. It's not the cost as much on the bus. And the technology is there that the majority of your routes could be served by a hydrogen bus, which offers you a lot more operational flexibility, fuel time, the range of the bus, resiliency. And so your implementation plan that you've already approved said you wanted the majority of your fleet to be hydrogen for that flexibility, but recognize that a mixed fleet would be overall important. So we're kind of going down that path. and. Um, 
So I think the key takeaway is when we come to you with future bus purchases, uh, we've got a different mindset than what we had even six months or eight months ago just because of the changing landscape. Uh, so I'm pretty excited. I, I think the future is, is really trending now towards zero emission. The tailpipe on those buses, whether it's natural gas or not, still has a real impact locally where we live because it's an emission coming out of that tailpipe even if it's a renewable natural gas. So I, I just think the leadership of the agency and the region, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to continue to tell staff bring to us ZEP purchases unless you absolutely just can't make it work. It would be nice for board members not to have to try to explain to the public there's yeah. two steps forward, one step back. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. They don't, you could spend a lot of time and energy yes. and you still don't get it. You know? yeah. Why would we do that? Why would you buy more uh, fossil fuel buses? Yeah. Even though we had a rationale on cost issue. Yeah. Very good. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Steve. This is great stuff. So this is the bus time application from uh, Clever Devices that we'll be rolling out to the public. Um, and this will be rolled out in February of next year. Oh, cool. And we hope to actually beat that. Um, so where's my bus? You have real-time bus tracking. You get your route information, your stop. OK, cool. But what I really want to know is when will my bus get here? <laughs> we'll have real-time predictions. There will be some uh, customizations that a user can or a, a uh, writer can opt for, mark bus stop favorites, etc. And we can also subscribe to, to prediction alerts. So in addition to that, there are we will have the ability to push out information to our riders as to disruption, let's say you have detours, you'll see, so, you know, back to where's my bus, when will, or when will my bus get here, <clears throat> let's say it's running five minutes late, or whatever, and because traffic doesn't happen here, right? You'll have information related to that, so people will have more insight into what's happening out there, and why their bus is a little behind, they'll have time to go grab a cup of coffee, etc. So really make it much more usable for our riders. So in addition to the AVL aspect, you see CAT or uh, you see the APC component or automated passenger counter on the agenda. We as of now do not have a contract for this aspect of the system. We will be bringing this to the board for consideration. Uh, we expect to do so this month. And with that, aside from utilization data and invaluable tools for planning. John has been uh, anxious to get this going. We will be able to provide our riders with crowding level information. And this would have been really valuable for uh, pandemic times or peak pandemic times uh, because we did set crowding thresholds on a bus. So that's just a brief overview. I really wanted to roll through this quickly so that we give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions. Any questions? Mm -hmm. It looks great. February? Yeah, that's February. What I'm wondering. When? February. So, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, February is our target. It's going to happen. Can you give us a quick idea of how an individual user with a smartphone would connect through this? Or, you know, what's what's so, it going to take on their end of it to make it work? So, this is going to be published through the App Store, so it'll be both iOS and Android available through that. But in addition to this, there will be a data backend to, so GTFSRT, which stands for General Transit Feedback, that you will be able to use other applications, such as Transit App, there will be a GMAP layer, so you don't necessarily have to use this application to get that information. Yeah. Any other questions? That sounds it. good, I All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. So as we transition into the affordable housing portion of this discussion, which we've heard a lot about uh, this morning, you know, Jared uh, mentioned a few times in his presentation the importance of linking 
housing, affordable housing to transportation, particularly focused in certain corridors. And we even saw evidence of support for that idea through the survey. Um, I wanted to introduce Bonnie Lipscomb, the Economic Development Director for the City of Santa Cruz, to give an update on the Metro Center um, Pacific Station project, which has been a really important partnership between Santa Cruz Metro and the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, for the, the redevelopment of not just our uh, transit facility in downtown, but also uh, 94 unit completely affordable housing development. So. <coughs> Thanks, John. And it's a pleasure to be before you today. Thank you for inviting me to, to give an update on where we are with Pacific Station. Um, before I start on that, I do have some handouts. Um, I don't have slides, although I realize it would be much better if I had slides. Um, but I do want to leave you with something, and I'll hand this one out afterwards. And it's just, we have so much housing going on. So it sounds like part of the theme for today, for some of for some of the topic today, has been talking about sort of the great need for housing and also that nexus between housing and transit. So one of the things uh, we've really been focused on, it's been such a challenge in our community, we have such a housing crisis, is, is really focusing on um, denser developments near transit. So sort of to that end, we have three projects right now in the downtown core um, building mixed-use affordable housing projects. Pack Station is, a, which really started with a collaboration with the Metro going all the way back to 2001, has morphed into two projects, Pack Station South and Pack Station North. And I'll talk about those in just a second. Um, but overall, and with some of our partners, we have over 400 units of 100% affordable housing in the downtown alone. We have close to 1,400 units in the pipeline, some already in construction, like the project um, right next to Laurel Street, 205 market rate units. It's actually that project um, dedicated some land to the city, which is now part of our PAC station project. So we're able to leverage that into more affordable units in our downtown core. So I will pass this out because there's actually about citywide over 2,000 units in the development pipeline in the city. And this will go a long way in our next regional housing needs allocation cycle that's coming up in 2023 to us hopefully meeting or at least on the track to meet some of our goals because I, I'm sure many of you are tracking on, it's pretty daunting what we have to achieve as far as affordable housing through the state. We want to do it. We're in this housing crisis. We're all in this together. Um, but it's going to be hard to secure those projects. So. You know, going back to Metro and Pacific Station, the projects and our collaboration together are just vital. I think it's vital to show um, that you know public-public and public-public-private partnerships can work. I think it's vital to show that uh, projects in proximity to transit are really where projects and where we should be focusing a lot of our energy. So to that, and I'm going to hand out just. Um, Just a, a few slides that show where we are with the project. And I'll say one of the benefits of doing projects on publicly owned land is that, you know, our focus and goal is to build this project together. So um, a little different than uh, many market rate projects is that we can help really support the project by providing that land. And that is definitely the case with Pack Station South and Pack Station North. Okay, it look like you, looks like you all have, have them, so I'm gonna sort of jump right in. Um, we do have some incredible developers working with us in the downtown on these projects with really depth of experience in doing mixed use projects, transit, and affordable housing. Um, specifically for Pack Station, we have two projects, and you can see on the bottom slide on that first page, um, the one on the top is Pack Station North, the one on the bottom is Pack Station South. Pack Station South is actually under construction right now. It's 70 units, 100% affordable. We are targeting, it's a combination of studios up to three bedroom. Um, we are, all of our units are between 30 and 60% of area median income. And so as a public entity, we can really come in and using some of, leveraging some of our affordable housing trust fund, ensure that those units with the deepest level of affordability get built. They're more expensive to build, they often need more subsidy, but we've been able to leverage our funding and secure some public um, funds through the state and through the local housing trust for program to match our city affordable housing trust fund for this project. 
for Pack Station North, um, we've been able to secure with Metro and with our and with our development partner over 51 million in state grants. We have uh, infill and infrastructure grant um, for 20 million um, for the for the project and for a lot of the public enhancements improvements. And that a lot of that funding will go directly to uh, part of the Metro, uh, you know facility itself from the tarmac to some of the solar elements that we're doing in the project. And then we also have an ASIC um, funding award of 30 million. Um, and that one um, has specifically 20 million that's going directly to housing and 10 million that's also going to public infrastructure. So between these two, we're, we're doing really well when we haven't even submitted our application or our building permit. So we're, we're, we're feeling pretty good. Um, you can see roughly the area in downtown Pacific. It's you know right where the current metro is, and um, what we're doing is we're exchanging from. If you're curious about the partnership that we have with Metro, is exchanging some of the land that we own south of Metro to get that frontage right on Pacific Avenue, so that we can focus a new office for Metro with housing on top of it, and then the new transit facility for Metro behind that, and taking up with a new tarmac and better sort of flow and orienting towards Front Street. We are making some changes to Front Street, including a new, um, on the intersection, a new lighted M intersection, widening it a little bit there to accommodate the bus turn radius, so we are making some improvements there. We're taking a little bit of corner of a property we own on the parking lot across the street on the front street side to accommodate that turning radius and the turn lanes that Metro needs for the buses. So that's that's the plan and you can see some of the layouts here. Um, also show, um, one of the things we're really excited about is also our partnership with Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Deantis. So in Pack Station South, we're including low cost medical and dental care as part of that project. And so there'll be a, an office space for the two of them and medical offices on Pack Station South, um, just south of Pack Station North. Where we are right now is we're planning on submitting our building plans in December. So we're working, we're working towards that. We're, we feel like we're in a good place. Um, we did, one thing we did change that we did do um, is that we originally were planning on doing an office on the second floor, um, Pack Station North. We're now going to be adding some more affordable units in there. Um, it helps us be even more competitive for our next funding round. So while we were originally targeting, uh, targeting 94 units, you'll see we're, we're actually up to probably, probably gonna be around 130 units in Pack Station North. Yeah, so we're getting even more units in the project. So February, March is the next uh, tax credit round application. We are, we are looking to make that round. And so where that puts us is completely on schedule for hopefully a decision and a funding award in May and June, and uh, potentially construction start uh, next year, November, December, weather permitting uh, 2023 timeframe. Um, with that at the back of this packet, just because I get so many questions about it, um, and it might be a slightly controversial project, there's some information about the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project. If you just are curious about what that project is, that's at the, the back as well. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and um, after I finish, I'll also hand out these other, other um, packet of information on just sort of the other housing projects that we have. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Thank you for having me any today. Any questions? Uh, let's move on to John. Are we back? To, where are we going next, John? SoCal Park and Ride, Brian? There we go, Brian. Hi, uh, Brian Spector, Spector Corbett Architects. Um, been in the community since uh, 1985. We've helped the Metro with various projects uh, over the decades, including your um, Watsonville Transit Center in 1994. We were the architects on that project. We helped you with your admin offices and a number of your other facilities. Um, so in specific, um, we're uh, assisting you with the uh, Paul Sweet Road Park and Ride uh, site, um, looking to land the uh, Paracruz uh, and Mobility Center there with about a 5,000 square foot building. Uh, 32 shuttle vans, 25 uh, driver parking spaces, 10 staff parking spaces, and some visitor parking spaces. Uh, so that's going to be pretty much a horizontal program on that site, um, which leaves uh, uh, room to go up. <laughs> so 
Uh, we put together an initial study for that site. Um, we met with uh, the uh, director for the Community Development and Infrastructure uh, Department with the county and one of their principal planners uh, to vet that information. So with the sustainability updates that are happening with the um, county's planning ordinances, uh, as a base level, that property could have 41 residential units. Uh, if we went 100% affordable with that, it would be subject to uh, the state uh, density bonus. Uh, uh, oh yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, state density bonus uh, units would get you an additional 33 units. So that site could actually hold 74 residential units. Um, so this is the property here. Um, Dominican is up in this area. Here's the Soquel uh, Avenue Bridge. So it's this park and ride. Um, your uh, property lines are actually a little bit tighter here and, uh, and come back to this uh, spot and the state owns that parcel. Um, so uh, GIS needs to be updated a little bit, but uh, it's a 1.3 uh, six acre site. So you could potentially get 74 units there. So we're looking obviously uh, the primary directive is to support the metro's operations um, with paracruise and the mobility center on the site but we have a lot of room to, to go up and, and get additional units on that property. So we're currently we're currently doing some uh, initial analysis for you on that. Um, uh, aside from that uh, your um, other facility or any questions on the Paul Sweet Road site? Looks great. Straightforward. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then the other site um, where you have a lot of opportunity is the, um, which is now dated uh, uh, Watsonville Transit Center. Um, so when we helped you with this project back in 94, this was a conversion of an existing uh, bank building um, into a bus terminal, and then, and then obviously with the bus circulation and, and multimodal transportation hub. Um, I think the, uh, the Metro has been having some preliminary conversations with the city of Watsonville about some of the opportunities on that site. Um, so similarly, um, there's room to go to go up and, and get a uh, substantial number of units on, on that property. Um, uh, and that site's just under an acre. So uh, depending on where the city um, ordinances are and some initial studies, it, it would probably be something similar to density that would you see at your Paul Sweet Road uh, site. So. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, I just want to say it feels so good to be part of an agency that actually is doing something about the housing transit connection yeah. that you know people talk about, but there's some real numbers here. It's really yeah. and, and real affordability of units we're building. It's really great. Yeah. Any other questions for our, our guests before we oh, have a lot of money? Good. Uh, Monty, do you have a question? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a perspective. So I think it's amazing this opportunity we have to build densely around transit. That's critical if we're going to move in the direction we need to move both with our county and nationally and beyond. Um, some things to think about. I think when we look at these buildings and these, these communities that we're going to build is to include a ground up perspective from the community because I think that that helps bring in the vibrancy and the perspective of what keeps things alive in the communities. Um, I have concerns when we talk about fully segregating and I know there's issues in terms of how funding is given to us for that segregating low income versus market rate because you, you end up potentially, like with the projects, having failures when you don't have integration of socioeconomic, um, cultural, and other aspects of our community, and you segregate them out. So if there was a way to um, be more inclusive and in integrative, I really would urge us to look at that. Also, street-level vibrancy, there's some great um, books and literature and research on how to create happy cities. Um, part of that is that ground up level communication with the community and inclusiveness, but also um, ensuring that we include this ground level life that is interactive between the street life and the people that live in those housing developments. Um, so again, there's a lot of research around it. I urge you to look at some of that that's out there uh, because it can make a great future of the vibrancy of our community as we grow it so rapidly. Let us not be so paced that we 
forget this important integration of vibrancy in our communities and how we can include the people in that. Um, and it's important to create walkable cities as well. So we have this great opportunity to do that. The one thing I think about is in every walkable community, there should be a market that you can go get your milk and eggs and small things. Um, that people don't have to necessarily worry about getting onto transit. So if you can create a block of housing, why not create a market as a part of that as well and other services that are easy access. Um, and I appreciate your time um, presenting this. This, like I said, is a great opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any comments, questions from the rest of the board? Appreciate our staff on the day. Yeah, no, it's been quite a Staff quite a lot. Salt. Oh. Yes. Shepherd. Yeah. Thank you. This this has been a really um, enlightening and great great workshop. Um, just to pick up that thread around housing, there is a real opportunity with the city and the county revising their housing element and potentially looking at zoning ordinances. So um, I'm looking forward to the metro district really being engaged in in, in as that effort goes underway starting January 2023. And around the table, I think everyone appreciates a great job oh, by the yeah. staff, oh, this Michael, was, all the consultants. No, no yeah. waste of time. Not at all. Yeah. Well, and just good content, just a wide yeah. variety, and just really, really exciting. So thank all of you. Yep. It's nice to get good news. Yeah, but things are moving. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's yeah. good. It's great. Any closing comments? No, other okay. than, it's, uh, you know what, your executive staff and all of your staff, they're top, they're top notch, right? And uh, so, I'd say hold on tight, I think yeah. because <laughs> a lot coming up, you got a lot of action items. Yeah, you already see what October and November may bring yeah. to the board, so. uh, All right, and to that end, I'll announce that our next board meeting for the directors is October 28th at 9 a.m. We'll be doing that via Zoom once again. And with that, I adjourn the meeting.